This is a comparison episode for compact EVs, so if it shouldn't be too small, but also not too big, just right for the city, but still electric vehicles that can be used for many purposes, maybe also for mid-sized trips or maybe here and there for some longer trips. Let's dig into the details because we're going to compare the Volvo EX30, the Volvo XC40, a little bit bigger one, the Zikra X, the smart hashtag 3, all of them are actually platform siblings. Then we do have the Tesla Model 3 as a base comparison because it is the most bought model. Yes, it is a little bit longer than the other ones. However, pricing wise, it is still comparable and therefore it is also often compared to these models we have here in the test otherwise. Then the Kia Niro EV, which is also similar to the internal brother, the Hyundai Kona EV. So everything we're gonna tell you about that more or less also counts for the Kona EV. And the Kia EV6, which is once again the bigger one, but that one is also often considered Kia Niro versus the Kia EV6. And of course it's sibling the Ionic 5. And then from the Germans, the ID3, recently facelifted and the very close comparator by the French manufacturer Renault, the Renault Megane EV. And the MG4, which is actually one of the best price performance offerings. I can already tell that to you right now here. So overall, very interesting EVs with a lot of differences, but also more or less than as for the pricing and the range, they all somewhat come close. But let's dig into the details of their unique features. Let's go. We've seen so many large electric vehicles. Now it's time for a small one with the all new Volvo EX30. Here with Thomas and Autogefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with all the details. Thor's hammer, LED signature, now in this segmented way. The main headlamp unit above it and below it. Cloud blue is this very light blue color. Very interesting indeed. I think the Volvo logo kind of has a retro styling now and all the way closed front because you do not need the cooling here for the electric vehicle. The market for the small EVs, it's not that large yet. So they make a smaller one than the C40 or the XC40. This one here at four meters, 23 or 167 inches. Wheels from 18 to 20 inch. These are the biggest ones. Yeah, the Volvo lettering is here, but I think still a classic Volvo logo in the middle part is missing. And this is also a Volvo of hyperlatives or superlatives because it is the smallest Volvo SUV so far. It is the quickest Volvo SUV ever. And it is also the most sustainable one from new production using 25% less CO2 and also raw materials and so on if you compare it to a C40 or XC40. Make no mistake, a used vehicle is always the most sustainable one because it's already built. But when you build new cars, it's of course very important also to bring down the use of resources and so on. Here the design, contrasting black roof and a very strong C-pillar overall. Some angular design we see. Rear wheel drive or all wheel drive then with one electric motor at the axle each. And the all wheel drive version then at 3.6 seconds in the acceleration figure to 1 km an hour, 62 miles an hour. The top speed is 180 kilometers an hour or 112 miles per hour. Overall, a kind of boxy design also in the rear. I like that angular styling. What about you? Tell me in the comments. Also here with the signature of the rear lights. However, the CD value is not the best one, 0.28. And that means it's rather a city SUV. On high speeds on the motorway, it will consume a little bit more, of course. Well, and then you get two different battery sizes, either 49 kilowatt hours net or 64 kilowatt hours net. Then it's in the bigger one, I would also recommend to have you know, just a little bit more range buffer. Realistic figure for the bigger one, probably like some 400 kilometers or 250 miles. However, recharging is pretty cool. AC charge, 11 or even 22 kilowatt, and the DC charging, 155 kilowatt. That means 10 to 80% state of charge in 26 minutes. Zzzz. Ahsoka has the white lightsaber, right? That's why I'm taking this one today. I'll soon show you why. <laughs> so let's take a look at the possible trunk. Yes, there is one, a small one. And when you fold it up, you have space for a charging cable. And underneath, that's why the light or the lightsaber of Ahsoka, here there's a nice moose pictogram. 
Not sure if you notice, but there's one design detail here. If you look from a little distance, it seems that the hood would be like standing out here or is overlapping. But if you come closer, you can see it is actually quite close to the chassis, so that's rather an illusion. And turning indicators here in the front, they replace the daytime running light. That looks pretty cool, doesn't it? And in the rear here, the indicators are pretty small, but still visible enough, I would say. This will be your new Volvo membership card. Yeah, I'm not kidding. This will be the car key like we know from Tesla, for example, or use your smartphone here with the NFC connection, holding it right there. Then door closing sound. Mm, nice, that's really solid. Inside of the doors, you can see a very minimalistic design here also with the door handle from the inside. That looks quite cool. And you get different deco elements. This is also made from recycling material. Soft touch at the top part and here also for your elbow. And what I like is here that you got the hard plastic, but then you have a structure here, so it looks a little bit more premium. And the inside of the door can fit a lot of things. And you see there is no button lever whatsoever also to reduce the complexity. And if that is too much for the decor for you, there are different decor stylings available. For example, also a recycled denim decor element. Same also in the counts here for the dashboard and the air vents are already here at the side. It's also a very interesting design. Oh, and I like this EX30 badge right there on the inside. Seats also sustainable. For example, these, the Nordico seats, it's a high-grade leather red with a mix of fabric. And once again, here also recycling and also using plant-based oils. So that's the way to go. Same also counts for the steering wheel. Let's get inside. It's a small SUV. And you can adjust it then here in the lower part. So just one button basically here for back and forth of the back part, going back and forth with the lower part. It's actually a very easy and intuitive control. And well, it is small from the outside, but I have quite good comfort here as a tall person with 189 or 602. When I go here to the side, still leave some headroom and even more than to this fixed panoramic roof. So you can go over this one or for a completely closed fixed one. And the steering wheel has a manual adjustment right here, up and down, in and out. Well, this is a prototype vehicle, but however, you can see these are not the instruments. And you can have it, like it says, camera sensor in there and that it watches you basically, that you get you know, fatigue or something and it warns you. But you can see when you adjust the steering wheel, it basically lifts up and down a little bit. Yeah, that's maybe the one weird thing I discovered here. And if you wonder why is it the case, well, it moves because it wants to track your eyes. We remember, for example, from Mercedes vehicles, often I set the steering wheel to a position like very low and then I'm blocking these sensors. However, do I want to be tracked in the vehicle? Me personally, not. What about you? Interior cockpit overview. Once again, very clean here. 12.3 inch screen, vertical styling. Then a very present deco element styling. And you can pick different stylings, as I said. Here, somewhat soft touch dashboard and also very unique first ever sound bar in a vehicle. Different speakers inside this one sound bar, but why are they doing that? First of all, either a base one or this one, the Harman Kardon optionally. And then you just have it at this very place and there's no speaker at the inside of the doors, no wires, no cables, also better sustainability because less material is being used. Very interesting, isn't it? On the steering wheel, you have one button per side, but with different functions. You know, I like to have separate buttons to push. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said. Um, but at least you have some haptic feedback here. And for putting in the gears, it's behind the steering wheel here. You just pull it up and down for drive and reverse and so on. Infotainment system is Android Automotive based means a native support of Google Maps. Also, when you put in a uh, destination, it calculates the charging stops and so on. No digital instruments means that here the speed will be displayed in the top part. Hmm, yeah, I haven't liked it with the Model Y or Model 3 by Tesla either. Temperature unit is right here. Relatively easy to see everything, but of course, everything into that screen. And this will then be the app overview. You will also be able to use Apple CarPlay wireless. When I make it a little bit darker here, join the dark side, then you can better see the small ambient lighting here on the right side. The glove box is actually here and you open it and the infotainment system. There we go with a lot of space inside actually. 
let's close it in the lower part an inductive charging pad very lower part you have it either like this or you can open it for more space and then you also have two usb-c chargers here the window levers on the inside and when you press this one you can also control the rear window levers and this is also funny here the middle console slides open and you have two cup holders or one cup holder or zero cup holders <laughs> and then once again you have a little bit more open space or slide it back like this half or all the way panoramic roof perspective from the rear of course the rear passengers can even better see that and talking about the rear passengers you have to remember it's a small SUV but let's try it out nevertheless and you can see when the seat is set to my driving position I cannot fit behind it that well so for tall adults is critical you have the same design at the inside of the door and these very cool door handles I really like them indeed and I can slide through because there's no middle tunnel using the EV platform and when I'm for example here behind the co-driver seat or passenger seat then of course you can adjust it a little bit better the bench is also quite low you can see here the angle of my knees so it's not meant for tall adults for a long journey or so in the rear yeah I think considering the length is actually okay nice the fabric use here as well with the Nordico material Nordico again is this high grade leather red and you also have separate rear window levers but they are also in the middle console this lower part here is storage here you can also take out from here for example use it as a trash or you know that you can easily empty it and once again we have these pictograms of the of the moose you know that the kids also have some fun with it so now not only holding the white lightsaber but also the dark saber <laughs> because it's time to measure the trunk here there's the button to open it electric hatch and we can first take own measurements here the length here yeah is about 72 centimeters to this notch it's about 28 inches you can see it's of course not the biggest one but it's a city SUV it's supposed to be small and underneath you have even more space for example you could also fit a charging cable here if you want to know all measurements you can also just look here above the will it fit and then you can see the full length here as well <laughs> in 4k so this is a good idea when you want to go shopping. I think this is proudly sponsored by IKEA, isn't it? <laughs> and here, the seats all the way fold flat. You have to do that from the second row. However, that's also standard for the segment that you can't unleash it from the trunk. Zoom. Yeah, I'm still waiting for May's Windows return. He's dead? No, he's not dead. He just fell off, right? So now about pricing. It will start below 40,000 euros and the easiest trim and also with the small battery. And then when you go for high trim and all wheel drive, then you end up about like 55,000 euros. And that's quite reasonably priced in the premium segment. Yes, of course, it's a small SUV, but if you compare the non-premium competition, there's not too much price difference. So I think a very interesting proposal looks pretty cool. Also here when you hold the light against the vehicle, right? And on the interior, this reduction of complexity, yes, we know it already from Tesla and it looks very clean and some new approaches are actually quite promising. I have always liked the Volvo XC40 and its SUV Coupe brother, the C40, but in the electric version, yeah, the range and efficiency were a little bit off. This is about to change. Or is it? We're going to find out with the upgraded XC40 here with Thomas Nautigefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go here with the front all the way close in the recharged version or this pure electric version. There are still also combustion engines available for the XC40, but this the pure EV. Cloud blue is this really super light bluish or maybe even grayish color. Very interesting one. And the Thor's Hammer LED. This one also has the optional pixel light for more performance. The length stays at 4 meters 43 or 174 inches. By the way, the C40 just a centimeter longer in the rear, but it's more this shape that is different. You can also get a two-tone roof. You just have to check that it's not really off as for the color combination. Wheels here, in this case, the biggest one that are available, 20 inch. They're a little bit more aerodynamic now, and they're also new aerodynamic 19 inch wheels. The most interesting technological change, before it was front wheel drive, or all-wheel drive, now it's the other way around, always a rear electric motor, and then you can also get the all-wheel drive version, or is that standard in your market, so the rear electric motor is always the stronger one, and they are also more efficient than before, 
supposed to give you a boost in range. The CD value, by the way, is 0.34 for the XC40 and 0.32 for the C40. So that means on the motorway, higher speeds, the C40 will be even more efficient. While looking at the typical Volvo SUV shape, let's talk about the second big change. The battery, the small one, stays the same. The bigger one now, a 4 kilowatt hour upgrade to 79 kilowatt hours net. And this will also, of course, bring more range. I would always go for the big battery. In some markets, a small one is even not available. And at the end of the review, we'll check out how much range we can score with that. And the charging upgrade here now, 200 kilowatt DC peak. That means 28 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. Turning indicators in the front look pretty fancy here. They replace the Thor's Hammer daytime running light. Turning indicator in the rear. It doesn't seem like LED here. However, it has this pulsing effect, kind of. What do you think? Tell me in the comments. Oh, oh, are we on? Sorry. Will it frunk or not? That looks clean. And yes, there is a small frunk underneath. Even here with this elegant back. Key fob, nothing special. Controls its side, not too practical, I found. Then door closing sound. It's actually quite decent. Then inside of the doors, here's also structured and soft touch material. Then you have this three-dimensional inlet right here. So it's actually quite likable. And also this felt covering on the inside. They also use recycled materials. Just the lower part here is hard pack. Seating position here, it's actually decently comfortable as for the ergonomics. And here 189, 62, still have some headroom left here. As for the seats, they look pretty cool. These here are the ones that have some kind of wool share. And the strange thing is that might be because Leah told me she, you know, she was here with the short shorts, short shorts. And then, you know, when the real skin is touching the seat, it can be, you know, you know, these um, effects from like wool clothing and so on. It can be kind of unpleasant on the skin. So I would actually prefer the full, either the full leatherette seats, they're available in all market, or in uh, UK or in Germany, you can also get the seats that have the microfiber. Then also the whole car is animal free, not in this case for the wool share. If you ask yourself, hey, why would that be like an ethical problem? The thing is, if you go with your own sheep, like with your own dog to a dog's barbershop, and then take, you know, the, the, the hair or the wool from it, no problem, but as long as it's industrialized, there's also a lot of suffering in the industry when it comes to wool. Then the panoramic roof here, it's an option. And here you can also apply this shade, it's good for hot days. And this is also still one you can actually really open. There we go, and leave some fresh air in. Interior cockpit overview, it's simple and clean. Soft touch on the dashboard, then this topography, style here with these three-dimensional touchable inlets. Below that is also somewhat soft touch, a vertical screen, steering wheel also with animal free material. And I like these matte buttons, rear buttons at the steering wheel for cruise control and to control the digital instruments. So not too much high gloss black here, just here. I really like the digital instruments. You can have this map view inside from the native Google Maps. You can also deactivate it, so um, you can yeah, pick it depending on your liking. And it's just easy on the right side to see the recuperation and so on, and left side to speed. Infotainment system, here this tile view. And then in the lower part, you have the climate unit. Here you can control the vent strength. But when you stay like this, then you can also have the individual. It's not so easy to control. It's more a car where I leave 22 degrees Celsius out or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you also have this app view. Now also features YouTube apps. You can also watch YouTube movies, like the real YouTube app then, when you download it to this one. And it also supports Apple CarPlay here, this integration. Just not Android Auto because they say, hey, we have this native uh, Google and native Android Auto integration anyway. And that's why it's also a good thing here. You have Google Maps natively integrated. That's of course a cool thing. Also with calculations for charging stops and so on. So that's heads off and also quick, super good. And we still have a big manual volume jog here. Lower part, two USB-C chargers, this one for connection, the other one for charging only. Well, and then there's an inductive charging pad, but that one actually not cooled. If you have the highest trim here, you also get this crystal line alike shifting lever. And you maybe heard it, when I put it to drive mode, the car also wakes up. 
cup holders, adaptive, and so they also hold these bottles tight. Check. Then this armrest here, nice material, underneath more space. I would like to know from you, if you have an XC40, are you using this paper basket, uh, this trash bin, the small one, because yeah, it tends to, you know, hold your hand when you go in there and then you can take the whole thing out, you know, um, but uh, I don't feel that it would be so useful. Well, what do you think? We have seats here on top of the rear doors. We also have soft touch and structured material. I like that. Overall nice from the build quality, just the lower part hardback again. And then considering it's a short vehicle, it still fits here for four tall adults. Not too much space left, but it works. And also as for the headroom, once again, the C40 would have a small compromise there, but it's not a large compromise for XC40 versus C40. You rather decide on the design. And yeah, I mean, the, the bench here is kind of upright, but it's still fine. And it feels more spacious than it looks like actually. Now to the trunk or the boot, 450 liters for the XC40. The C40 would be a little bit limited here in height, but that's it actually. Here, two times suitcase and backpacks, no problem. With almost a meter of 40 inches and the length is a little bit less than 90 centimeters or 35 inches, or we fold it two thirds of the seat, one third is the other one. And here underneath, you can have this splitter, it's actually quite good, and then have more space underneath. And then here on the right side, there's a button that unlocks this towing hook and it's semi-automatic. As you see, I just touch it here that I don't get my hands dirty. Um, there we go. And I have to push the button again. And then you have to push it back. What I also want to show you here on a parking lot, when I have the seat belt not on, which you shouldn't do, of course, but just want to show you the warning chime there for the seat belt. I think that's one that is not that annoying, but still it is present enough, you know? So I think good move. For XC40 EV or recharge, we start with an acceleration onto the motorway from 50 kilometers an hour to 100. Let's see, let's go. Plop, that's it. Woo! Yeah, this all-wheel drive model is really quick. The acceleration figure from zero to 100 kilometers an hour, or zero to 60 miles an hour, is always under five seconds here with this all-wheel drive model over seven seconds with the rear wheel drive only model. If that's available in your market, for example, the US versions are always with the dual motor and whoo, that's really quick and it feels even quicker than before, before uh, because <laughs> you know, it's still a little bit adrenaline rush here. And that's a Volvo XC40, compact SUV, you know, not like a real sports car or something. So the cool thing is that with this new setup, where the rear wheel drive motor is either standalone or in the overdrive drive configuration, it's the stronger one, you're getting the push from the rear before you get the pull from the front. And it just feels better and sportier by that way. Also, when you just slightly on the throttle, you always feel that push from the rear. That's just more driving fun. And soon we'll also go up a mountain, dynamic driving. There we will feel this new setup even more. And then, of course, efficiency, now more efficient, the electric motor itself. And also the front motor can be uncoupled when it is not being needed. That's, of course, also good for efficiency. Interesting also talking about efficiency. As for the recuperation, which is now set all the tone to adaptive recuperation. I can show you. Here in front of us is the C40. You can see the different roof line, more or less the same vehicle, but the CD value is a little bit different, as I told you earlier. 0.32 for the C40, 0.34 for this one. CD value, when it's higher, it's always worse in this case. And so, especially on motorway driving, the C40 will be more efficient. But then with the recuperation, there's not that I would pull the lever back to like a B mode or something. And when I just lift the throttle and there's a car in front of us, I have no cruise control set still the speed is being reduced. Let me approach the vehicle here one more time. And now I go off the throttle. See here, recuperation is active, full recuperation, because there's a car in front of me. Now, car is gone. It's like, a, it's like being scripted, right? So here now, go off the throttle, no recuperation. The car is just rolling. And that's actually a good thing in a way that you don't have to care about any recuperation modes or something. 
the car does it on, it on its own and it's almost like having adaptive cruise control set. The only disadvantage some people argue, and I can also follow this argument, argument in a way, it's less predictable. So, for example, to have it even better as for the whole driving feeling for the passenger here, it's sometimes good that you exactly know what the car is doing and that there are no additional g-forces being applied when you don't expect it. So this is definitely pro and contra. For the driver, it's definitely more convenient in a way. Um, yeah, I think you can follow this argument. BMW is also tending in this direction. I can, of course, also set the cruise control. It also has an active cruise control setting. You can switch it and here for example the car is being actively kept in the lane it's also actually well done it's a smooth process the radar sensor also to enable this this you know this new adaptive recuperation radar sensor has been changed and now here we said keep this hands on the steering wheel the radar sensor has been changed and now sees even further so um, I found that the range has been more than doubled where the radar sensor can also check the vehicles in front of you, that is of course also good development and even adds more to safety. However, here you can still set these recuperation settings, driving and then here's an auto. If you put it to off, then it's always just rolling. Or if you put it to on, when you then lift the throttle, then it's always a hard recuperation. Here on the motorway, it's actually reasonably silent, good upper seating position. You feel you have a small compact SUV, yes. But the seating habit is good, the general seat ergonomics and so on, so you can also imagine longer trips, although it is still a small vehicle, that's of course a good thing then to have. Really nice these um, turning indicators, how they are cascading there, that's uh, always a very cool feature. Um, this vehicle here we have also equipped with the optional pixel LED. Yeah, they, can they tend to be really expensive when you add all the options, that's the, the downside. As for the steering feel here already, it's actually quite good. Not the most natural feeling, it feels a little bit artificial, but it is comfortable to steer, you don't need much force, and you also have a reaction in small degrees angles, so it doesn't deceive you in any way. So I'm overall also happy with the steering feeling. So two very important things now to come and the one is definitely the efficiency on you know long term and so on and the other one is the dynamic driving that's coming up right now now let's move it in an agile way also here uphill whoa has a lot of power reserves that's it's it's almost a performance suv but i mean almost it is a performance suv <laughs> acceleration wise the suspension is also rather stiff I would say and especially here the combination with the 20 inch wheels we are driving when it's a little bit uneven on the road then it can get bumpy however here now good roads then it feels really cool and sporty as I said the steering lacks a little bit natural feedback so I don't know exactly what I'm doing you know talking on a high level here so I don't feel one with the steering and the vehicle and the road but it's still nice and fun to drive so like steering and suspension and body roll wise you feel it's not laid out to be a performance SUV but it's still fun to drive. The seats of course are also not laid out for performance driving so they lack a little bit of side support so that's not the main focus of this vehicle but it's still nice in a way because it has these compact dimensions and so on and yeah accelerating out of the corners here that's the most favorable part here now with this upgrade because it's just feeling so much sport here. You remember when you're getting more power on the front wheels, you rather have understeering here when you have more power at the rear wheels, you rather have oversteering and yeah, I mean, considering, you know, but it's just, well, with a panoramic view, it's just really a lot of fun just to steer it around the corners, especially. That's, that's really super, super cool. And then talking about the efficiency figure before I did this fast uphill drive and we landed at about 18 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers with mixed some motorway excavation some city and so on that is around three and a half miles per kilowatt hour that is better than before and not as good as the Polestar 2 we've just driven with the same technology 
Polsa 2 just has a better CD value. Here then it would mean a realistic range of 440 kilometers or 270 miles. And that's definitely a huge increase because before that it could be well below 400 kilometers or 250 miles. So here two things bang together, a little bit bigger battery and the increased efficiency. So it won't be like this range wonder now suddenly, but definitely a good upgrade that helps you. And the C40 will, as I said, be a little bit more efficient, especially when you drive more motorway and so on. This here is the Zeker X. It's a compact electric SUV. And in our aesthetic review, it has already impressed us with all the features considering the price. However, today it's also about driving. Is it also good in the driving dynamics? And how does it rate against the competitors internally? Because these are the siblings, Volvo EX30, Smart 3 or Smart 1. And of course, it's also fighting against the other German competitors. Here with Thomas Naudegefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with the front design here in this gray color. That looks pretty cool. Angular light design here also really playful but I think it does suit the European styling. Main headlamp unit below that. And you already saw here when I open and close the vehicle, then we have these animations here, also the turning indicators, but you can even activate a full light show. We have another green vehicle here for you, and there we can see the full glory of the light signature, or this light show, both in the front and also in the rear, maybe also reminding us a little bit of Kit and Knight Rider. The length here is 4 meters 43 or 174 inches, compact electric SUV. Wheels 19 or 20 inch. Here the bigger ones 20 inch, these two choices. Here also this crossover wheel edges, but always then in this high gloss black. You either get a rear wheel drive version, so one electric motor in the rear, 5.6 seconds in the acceleration figure, or all wheel drive, so one electric motor per axle. Then the acceleration is at 3.8 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And that's already performance car alike. As for the rear, also a very angular European alike design. They also play a lot with the lights here, for example, this is a goodbye show. That looks pretty fancy, doesn't it? And what's also interesting is that they do offer a towing capacity, even in this segment here, 1.6 tons. And that not only counts for the all-wheel drive, but also for the rear-wheel drive version. As for battery and range, only one battery available, 66 kilowatt hours net. That's not the largest one, but also not super small if you compare it to the competitors. The realistic range, I mean, like in most ideal conditions, you can score some 400 kilometers or 250 miles with the first calculations. We'll later on test it also when we really drive it. And in worse conditions, maybe 300 kilometers or 200 miles. Once again, later on, concise testing values. Recharging is interesting. They offer 22 kilowatt AC charging. That's, of course, very good. And then 150 kilowatt DC peak, it's around yeah, a little bit less than 30 minutes then from 10 to 80% state of charge. So, will it frunk or not? Here we go. Well, there's one. Oh, ain't that cute. Tiny, but there is a frunk. This is the key fob. I'm still glad to have a key fob at all, actually. A very unusual one. You can also open or close the vehicle when you hold it right here. And then you can see here these door handles. They are either flush, this integration, or then when you open the vehicle, they fold in. I'm never a fan of these complicated solutions because at some point they might fail and so on. Um, then you can see here frameless windows and door closing sound is actually good, although it's frameless. That's also quite impressive. And the interior build quality, let's check that one out. Here, this is the beige interior here, beige blue mix, really impressive indeed. And wow, I mean, what you can touch and feel, super soft, high-grade leatherette, completely animal-free. Also here, galvanized as for the window lever controls, for example. So this is really high build quality. The lower part, however, and then this hard pack. And also the rest of the interior has this beige-blue mix. If you think that is too loud or too unusual for me, there's also a dark gray one available. So you can also pick that one. And I think that also looks quite cool. So. I like both interior colors. You can pick between those two. It's similar like with Tesla, for example. In any case, here the seat is really comfortable. The material is super soft and also the base ergonomics, really good. Steering wheel also feels very good. So the interior build quality from the first side is really impressive. And here, 
these are still real controls on the steering wheel and by that here by the way you can either for example control the volume and on the left side you control the cruise control that leads us to the interior cockpit overview really clean i like the beautiful color combination on the top part you have these indentations here the structure again in the chinese version by the way on the market you can also move this whole screen to the passenger side that's not allowed in the eu spec vehicles you always have this screen with a rather horizontal layer out the climate control always stays here in the lower part but you can also control it from the steering wheel or with the voice control for example and in this screen here is typical tesla layout where you once set your individual driving settings and then basically leave them as it is what is interesting is here you have this app view and they also offer apple carplay or android auto that is different to tesla and this huge integration of apple carplay look at the google maps integration here wow and when you swipe down here, you can activate the pet mode. We also know that function from Tesla, have introduced that. And here when I open and close the door then, there we go. Then we can also see that we can see from the outside that the AC is on. And there's even a visualization on the B pillar that the pet mode is activated. It's also a nice idea. Ambient lighting, you can set individual colors. You can also have an animation or alongside with the music show, of course, it's better to see when it's dark. Digital instruments, clear and simple to read. And I think this is also enough, or what do you think? And the head-up display is also standard. And the head-up display also has some guidance, even with some arrows when you approach an intersection. And beautiful details, look at that here, the structure here on the wiper lever, that is, you know, really cool. I love these details. Here, this inside headliner, microfiber, this is from 100% recycled material. And here, look at that detail, like classic luggage style or something, this, you know, handle here. Yeah, when it's the overdrive version for 3.8 seconds. More premium details here, for example, on the driver's side to store glasses here and also with this microfiber, Wow, that feels pretty cool. Beautiful light integration here in the top ceiling. Yamaha sound system here, 13 speakers and actually delivering a pretty cool sound. So uh, yeah, like that. And also the visual part here is actually interesting. Then USB-C connectors, 27 and 60 watt even. So even for laptops suitable. Then there's another hanger here and listen to that. Also nice ASMR. Then you have this storage here um, however on the top part this is prone to scratches here then in the middle console you can slide this one open for cup holders you can also open that one for cleaning and so on more storage and here this is the inductive charging pad and here this white plastic area this you know gets dirty quite a lot there is cooling that is actually a good thing 50 watt and to put your smartphone in there you really have to squeeze it in there but then it's also pretty secure and you can also lift that whole thing in this case and you can also leave your smartphone in this is also a problem with the inductive charging pads if they're like enclosed you can see here it says like uh, press twice to pay so apple pay is being activated when they are like enclosed that way inside of the rear door soft touch materials really good build quality once again that feels really premium and then here in the rear as for the space we have first of all for four tall adults it's fine actually i still have some leg room left very close also the structure here at the back part of the seat then headroom underneath this fixed panoramic roof still works with 189 or six foot two this one, by the way, blocking from the outside 99% of UV radiation and also most of the heat. However, I think that it still gets hotter here when you compare it to a fixed roof. Once again, the seat material is really super soft. It just feels nice to touch it, actually. So it is a premium atmosphere. Then you fold this one down. Also have some adaptive cup holders. So I think considering the exterior length, it's also a good offering of space on the rear interior. In the lower part, by the way, you have USB-C chargers, USB-A and USB-C. Another detail here in the rear, these hangers here for jackets. I think it's really beautiful and also pretty solid. Let's check out the trunk. First of all, you search like where they were open this one and then underneath this illuminated logo, there's this small button and that is actually on the opener for the electric hatch. 360 liters or 13 cubic feet so it's not too large you have this cover here that you easily put up yeah it's like a simple solution i would say the width here is less than 
a meter of 40 inches and the length is about 80 centimeters or 31 inches. And then of course when we put this one out you still have some more space underneath. For example then for the charging cable. Here we go. And to fold the seats best is to fold this one down and then reach out for these straps here. Maybe the head restraints down here. These straps pull them and then you can push them forward. Yeah, there we go. This and also, yeah, it's not the easiest solution. There we go. So, acceleration from 10 to 80. Oh, that's it. Whoo! Yeah, David is accompanying <laughs> me today. <laughs> Speechless. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what the hell just happened? So, that was pretty quick here having the all wheel drive model. And even when we are at speed, like 70 to 110, let's go. Plop, that's it. Yeah, super quick indeed. Remember, 3.8 seconds is the acceleration figure to one kilometer an hour or six to miles an hour from zero. However, when accelerating, the car did not feel that confident, I have to say, because, you know, I was not completely straight. I had still like a, you know, like a slight bend there and this didn't feel too controlled. So I feel I had fast vehicles that were easier to control while accelerating. Let's, let's take it that way. Of course, from the whole setup of the vehicle, it's also not meant to be a true performance car or something. Um, however, the performance itself is definitely there. Here on the motorway, here at yeah, one, one, 10 kilometers an hour, like 60, 65 miles an hour, I think it is not that silent. So do picking up some wind noise. However, it is quite loud and windy outside today. You've maybe seen in also in our static shots. Um, but I feel some other competitors would be a little bit more silent here. I've also driven the Zeker 001. That is the large sedan, five meters long and so on. And that one also was a little bit more silent. Of course, it also stands less against the wind and so on. As for the suspension, being here on the motorway, so far so good. I think they found a good compromise here with the 20-inch wheels. At the moment, we don't have fierce bumps and so on. I'll also comment on that later. If you want more comfort, you would need to seek the 19-inch wheels. Of course, then you have a little bit more tire dampening as for that. Let's do some more lane changes, see how the suspension shakes up or not. Just here at 110 km an hour, lane change to the right. Oh, suspension stays relatively stable. The steering wheel itself doesn't give me the most natural feeling. However, there's no dead zone area. Here at the moment, there are different settings available. I have the sport setting, then you have more resistance here. But there is, let's say, not the smooth transition from the lower to the higher degree angles. Let's see if I put it to normal, if that's actually better. Interesting. So usually I prefer more feedback in the steering wheel. But in this case, the sport kind of artificially makes it stronger. And I feel that the normal steering setting is a little bit lighter, yes. But it feels in a way more natural because I think it fits better to the overall vehicle when you have it here in this normal setting, actually. Then when we get off the motor over here, let's talk about the recuperation levels. Here at the moment, I've set it to high, actually. And when I get off then here and just leave the throttle, then I have notable recuperation. Here I can also set it down to medium. When I then lift the throttle, there's a little bit less recuperation. Is it a one pedal driving feeling? Um, that's also strange here for the GPS here. We have set the mute setting for everything before and now it kind of unmuted itself. So they still have to do some software tweaking. Um, I think that's the thing. Also, we have a lot of blinking, beeping, and so on. So the thing is here on the Chinese market, usually their software is, um, we experienced that with, with the Xpeng vehicles, for example, that on the Chinese market, they have their software up to date. Everything works well. Then to European market, they need to adapt it. And also, for example, they don't have the lane keeping assist working properly yet and so on. So they need to do some adaptations. This is all software work. And both, you know, like new manufacturers and also traditional manufacturers are at this moment to uh, actually struggling with their software work. So here at lower speeds now inside the city, let's test it. Energy recuperation level high. Yeah, this is notably now. Yeah, 
So definitely, yes, that is upon pedal driving and medium. Let's see. Yeah, it's a little bit less, but still also notable. So here it's rather about strong recuperation, no matter if you go medium or high. High is then just really then the one pedal driving feeling. One more acceleration. Plop, that's zero to 50. Wow, so quick. And everyone else is gone. Of course, usually in normal driving life, you would not accelerate that hard. Um, and what we can also do to make it a little bit more relaxing on the passengers, set it here, for example, to standard. Stop typing. Watch the review. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> oh, like general overview. You know. uh, here, when you uh, um, set the acceleration to standard, for example, or even subdued, then it's just more relaxing, you know, and here for the passenger, it's not like, you know, it's always like flying around with the heads and so on. So it's always about the G-forces. I always realize that when I'm being shuttled in electric vehicles and the shuttle drivers have not driven electric vehicles so far, and then they're really like fast acceleration, strong recuperation, and you're in the back there and there's like, Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I think it's a good idea, especially when it's so capable, the vehicle, to set it to a lower acceleration level, level just to keep the G-forces down to the passengers. I'm not sure how you guys can pick it up on the camera, but something is constantly blinking, bleep, this, you know. These are warning th things, and they promise to still update that. We are driving very early prototype vehicles, and we have experienced that before, actually that the software status is not like you know on the on the highest level the thing is that when the hardware is all right you can still work on these software things however as i said a lot of the manufacturers also the classic or the established ones just name like vw skoda seat audi they also have a lot of software problems recently because everything is going so fast so quick all the development and so on and you have to keep up and nowadays manufacturers are throwing stuff on the market and then work on it while being live on the market like you do with smartphones or software back in the days you develop a vehicle seven years you know of the life cycle and then it was basically finished so one thing that definitely helps against the sounds here when you deactivate the driver fatigue warning then it's definitely more silent here. So that I don't have to finger around here in the infotainment system for the climate unit, I can really use my right thumb here and then just control the climate unit up and down and also left and right for the vent strength. I think that is a very beautiful idea how to integrate the climate unit and then don't have physical knobs here. I still always love physical knobs down here, definitely, but this is one solution where I can definitely live with. I think I found a good solution that you can still control it. When you press here on the right, by the way, one more time, then you can check consumption data, for example. You can also um, control your music and so on, but we can always get back here to the AC menu as well. So now driving a little bit slower here, countryside, all those beautiful houses here as well in the Stockholm outside Stockholm area and when you're driving really slowly this car behaves absolutely beautiful you know like the short length and so on and then it's also silent enough it's also easy to steer and control and you can also enjoy the comfort of the seats once again the seats here and the interior build quality is one of the best unique selling factors here for the vehicle just when we were on the motorway, I think they could maybe work a little bit on the insulation there and also on the steering feeling. But here at lower speeds, the steering feeling is absolutely fine. Yeah, and definitely what we've already experienced is they need to work on, you know, on all the software details, you know, that, that don't get the error message all over the place and so on. But as I said, that's kind of common for very early prototype vehicles as well. We have all-way drive, so here a little bit of gravel road, but when we accelerate here, is it still safe? Oh, nice. We have some tire rolling, but still kept it in the lane. However, now I was also at subdued when I, when I put it here to sport. Let's see, here's nothing happening here. Let's just go back reverse. Here, by the way, also that's not working yet. Putting in reverse gear, the camera is not appearing. They also need to work on that. But they also said they are still working on these systems here. So, let's see, now in the sport mode. <laughs> Ooh, now I have to go off the throttle a little bit. That's fun, but I think all-wheel drive system-wise and you know how the wheels are reacting and so on, that is actually well done. So, yeah, I mean, attacking this one here, gravel roads, 
um, also a lot of fun. So I think it's also really interesting for us always to deliver you, you know, like slow driving, faster driving, motorway and so on, like a wide variety, like a nice mix. Here, by the way, from the gravel, from the stones in the wheel arches, it's actually not too loud, so that is actually quite well done. Where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea where I'm going now. <laughs> Maybe I have to update my software first. <laughs> we are in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> now we did a bigger consumption test loop and we ended up at about 21 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That's three miles per kilowatt hour, meaning a realistic range of 320 kilometers or 200 miles. Well, that is not the best efficiency result. We scored similar figures with the Zika 001 with the larger vehicle. So the electric motors, they don't seem to be that efficient, not super bad but also not on top of the segment. They are rather, you know, towards the bottom of the segment as for the consumption figures. Interior build quality here and the premium atmosphere, that is actually top notch here. And then they also have to work on the software, assistance systems and so on to adapt it to the European market. Pricing, however, very interesting. 45 to maximum 50K, everything included. So the price difference is just front wheel drive or all wheel drive just minor, you know, other extras, you always get the full pack and considering that, that price is very decent because for the competitors, you also have to pay way more than. Hmm, that's very interesting. The Smart Hashtag 3 is a new compact EV. It comes with a Mercedes background developed and designed by Mercedes guys. Now owned 50-50 by Mercedes and Geely and from this Geely background, there are also the other siblings like the Volvo EX30 and the Zeker X. How good is this one here and how is it different from the smart hashtag one and can we just get rid of the hashtag? Ah, oh, maybe, yes. <laughs> so we can also just call it smart three. Take a look at it in the front. It's Thomas and Autogefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go. Light strip goes all the way through. We have a matte bright blue car here called electric blue and then this air intake style in the lower part. There's just a little one in the very lower part. There will also be a Brabus version available and with higher performance figures. This will also have a distinctive look in the front. The length at four meters 40 or 175 inches. That's 13 centimeters or seven inches longer than the smart one. Also a little bit longer wheelbase. And if you compare it to the other siblings out there, the Zika X is just a little bit longer, but hardly any difference. The other ones are smaller. Here, 19 inch wheels. The Brabus version would come with 20 inch and you usually start with rear wheel drive and once again, the performance version, then all wheel drive. 3.7 seconds would be the all wheel drive acceleration, 5.8 for the rear wheel drive. Both actually pretty quick. And here, have you seen already here in the side profile, this one is clearly a Mercedes design. I think you can directly see that. In the rear light strip from the left to the right, and the top speed will be 180 kilometers an hour or 112 miles per hour. In the lower part, we have more contrast and overall it's a very clean design indeed. And there will be also a hidden opening button for the trunk, soon more to that. As for the battery size, 62 kilowatt hours net, that's for all the models. It's of course not the biggest battery, but then again, they also try to keep the price down. So it will range somewhat, very roughly between 40 and 50,000 euros, depending on which version, version you pick actually. The expected range, well, it's of course always the difference between official figures and what's really realistic. So my estimation at this moment, maybe some 350 kilometers or 200 miles. Of course, we will deliver a driving test soon to that as well. As for recharging, it's interesting that they also offer 22 kilowatt AC charging and then 150 kilowatt DC peak. And then from 10 to 80% state of charge, you'll go in under 30 minutes. And now let me show you the goodbye and opening ceremony. You can also take a look right here. It's nice animation and also the turning indicator integration like here. There we go. Once again, the hello. What about the light show in the rear? This is this welcoming function once again. It's also pretty cool. Like reminds me of like Kit Knight Rider, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, Michelle is also nodding behind the camera. And also here the turning indicators, slim integration. Actually quite cool the whole light design, isn't it?
that all work with this round key fob. I mean, why not being a little bit different? Also good um, premium quality, actually. And when I open the vehicle here, you can see the otherwise flush door handles come out. Reminds me a little bit of Jaguar F-Type, doesn't it? Um, with a badge here, this is like actually three-dimensional, so really nice premium details. So I'm very positively surprised about that. I always love to hear, feel, see these details. Then also door closing sound. Wow, that's impressive because frameless doors and you still have a nice door closing sound that is very rare and takes a lot of effort and build quality. Then there's here this soft touch leather red at the inside of the doors and a very clean design, yet we have real window levers and also how smooth they react, the, you know, the window reaction to the pressing of the button. It's very convincing indeed. Actually, large door pocket. This is then the hard pack material, but it is integrated in a way that has this seamless design once again. Also very much attention to detail. Then this is here the so-called premium interior. This would be the high trim. The low trim would also come with the leather red steering wheel and leather red seats. Here, however, in this trim then, they are still coming with animal skin parts, which is, of course, not fitting to the rest of the sustainable approach of this vehicle. The Brabus, by the way, would come with microfiber on the inside of the seats. Then seating position. Well, it's a compact vehicle, but still leaves headroom with 189 or 6 foot 2. Steering wheel has a very smooth process up and down, in and out. You can almost do like with, with two fingers, like that's how well built this is. So I'm really, um, really surprised by the good build quality. And this is no comparison to past smart models. It's like a completely different new brand actually, and especially as for the build quality. Interior cockpit overview, wow, look at that. First of all, which car does it remind you of? Tell me in the comments before I, I tell you, so time to write now the comment and then see if you agree with my verdict. This is basically almost taken like, you know, from a, a past generation Mercedes AMG GT with these vents here and then also this opening, isn't it? And the cool thing is, once again, clicking, closing and opening here for this inductive charging pad and USB-C charging. So the build quality is just amazing and it's actually better than in recent Mercedes vehicles. I can really say that. Here, once again, clicking sound with the air vents here. And look how they did the transition between this, like the dark element, and this is the bright, like this matte uh, silver style. Also, not the high gloss black piano lacquer and stuff. And then you have this seamless transition here from the bright to the more black area. It's a great idea indeed. I don't really agree with the color combination with the brown here. That might be better in a different way, but the rest here is like, you know, you can really applaud them for that. And in lighting here, we can directly switch it, and then you can also see how it adapts directly. So you have a lot of possibilities for that. Then here in the middle console, once again, nice clicking and cup holders, also adaptive. And here, another storage, and it's also with a cooling function. Then you have this separate slot here for your charging card. You can always store it like that for the charging stations and so on. And listen to that. Glove box. It's also properly dampened when it falls down. And there's also an additional storage here underneath the middle console. That is, however, a little bit prone to scratches, I see. On the steering wheel, we have real buttons, also with a good quality, so no hashtag capacitive BS here. 9.2 inch digital instruments, really slim, but definitely do the job. And you also have a head up display. 12.8 inch infotainment system. I always prefer real climate knobs. You have to change the temperature right here or with the voice control, for example. There are some hotkeys in the lower part, for example, that lead you to the setting of the recuperation. You have to the e-pedal, like one pedal driving feeling or driving modes. And when you switch them, then in the instruments, the digital instruments, you also have these sounds and these animations for that. Then this left control here, actually quite good overview where you can switch the different modes and so on, all the settings for the sound system. This here with the optional beat sound system. We always get here with this hotkey or go back again, range meter, that's optimistic definitely. And then there's a home screen like this, but also this app menu structure, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto will also be featured. Oh, here we have the clear proof that the door handles were taken from the Jaguar F-Type. <laughs> And you also have this 360-degree camera, so this is, of course, 
just a faked image of the vehicle, not the actual one, but the cameras around it, they build up this camera image then. Rear seating area, this the seat as I would be driving as a tall driver, and I still can sit behind, so it's actually good usage of space. Remember, it's not a long vehicle at all, and also headroom is no problem here. This is a fixed glass roof, and there's also no additional cover. There's also always, of course, a coating, but still it might get a little bit hotter. What I love is these details here. Look at that, the ambient lighting integration at the back part of the seats and also the separate climate unit here has more ambient lighting on the inside. The color can be adjusted as well and also clicking sounds for this unit, USB-C, USB-A charging underneath. And more details like this one here with the armrest when you press that one down, like the feedback acoustically and also haptically it gives you when you put it in the lowest position also adaptive yeah that's actually quite nice inside of the doors in the rear by the way here this is hard pack the upper part is also soft touch always important with evs does it have a frunk it does a small one oh <laughs> that's cute however it does have one and it also fits in a charging cable if you like this is really a contest of the best integration or best hidden integration of a trunk opening mechanism and it's really inside the a you can really not see that. That's nice, isn't it? So there we go with the electric hatch. 370 liters. See here also there's this manual cover like this with rails. And the width is a little bit less than a meter or 40 inches. And the length about 83, yeah, it's about 83 centimeters or 33 inches. And I've already folded one part of the seat here, like one third, two thirds split. There's also a ski hatch available. In the very front here, on top, you also have another storage for charging cables. This is the first tour of the updated Model 3 by Tesla. This Model 3 facelift here with Thomas Nautical in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go. Most obvious change, the lights here in the front, a new slimmer design. After all, it maybe started to look a little bit aged. And here, this is a new, more modern and also more aerodynamic look. But it's not only the aerodynamic look, really, they have improved aerodynamics. You can already see it here on, the, on top of the hood and supposed to be overall 5% more efficient. Aerodynamic is the one thing for that. Yeah, more to come. For example, they have also optimized the wheels in the rolling resistance and so on, and also supposed to give you more comfort. So we will go through even more different features here. This is also a new gray color. There's also a new red color available, for example. Wheels here at the moment in 19 inch, and you will still get the normal standard range and the long range model. Standard range with rear drive only. This is here at the moment the all wheel drive model. The battery sizes will also remain unchanged. Well, these different tires here, they have one compromise to it. They had to lower the top speed now at 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour. For a German, that might be a problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 200 is actually also enough for me, I have to say. But of course, for all the different other markets, it's not a real issue then to lower the top speed. And by that, they could also improve both comfort and the rolling resistance then of the tires overall. The typical side profile of the Model 3 from the outside, this is actually unchanged. There are more solutions here in the detail. For example, when I open the doors and look at these windows here from the top, they are now dual insulated, both in the front and in the rear, and you can really literally see that. So this will massively improve the noise insulation. If you want the color names, it's Stealth Gray here or Ultra Red for these two new colors, by the way. Well, these optimizations in the aerodynamics, they actually serve both purposes to bring down the consumption or increase the efficiency and also to bring down the noise level on the interior. So we have both things playing together. The outside optimizations to bring down the noise level, plus the insulation then all around the vehicle in the new windows. But the question is, especially from the interior, so far there was a huge gap between the Model S and the Model 3. And so many other manufacturers have brought up their new electric vehicles. So Tesla had to do something in the interior. If you wonder about this really crowded surrounding, it's the IAA Motor Show in Munich. And also a lot of interest here in the new Model 3. Because everything we see from these upgrades is supposed to give only 1,000 euros extra in price. And that's of course kind of astonishing. Can they actually 
upgrade the whole level of the Model 3. Here, now again, you can see these insulation windows, both in front and the rear. You can see this dual, and actually feel this dual insulation there. And the door closing sound, by the way, also sounds really good considering it's a frameless door. Then inside, oh, I need to tune down that sound on this demo mode here. <laughs> inside of the doors, soft touch top part, and also here, all high grade leather red. And this is also new the ambient lighting, and that continues here in the inside of the doors and goes further also, like this Jagger used to call it river hoop, like on you know, boats, expensive yards, here, all the way across the interior and to the other side, and even continues at the rear doors. If you can take a look here and um, show the window, I can open that for you. Here, the ambient lighting continues at the other side, also in the rear door. So this brings more premium atmosphere to the whole interior. Then, to me, the biggest news is here, the seats at the moment. Model S, Model X, maybe reminds you. All, of course, and free the whole interior, as it should be. Then now perforation, of course, also bright and black is available. And they are way wider. And one of my main criticism aspects of the Tesla Model 3 so far was I was really happy with the package and pricing and so on and efficiency and range, but the seating comfort to me was always off with these seats. So the material was soft, but here now this is a completely different experience because the seats are wider, they fit taller people also better, you have better support right here. So this brings a better seating comfort. It's a huge step for the Model 3. To me, actually, the most crucial thing about this facelift. As for headroom, these seats are you know, quite voluminous now. Let's see about the headroom. This here with 189 or 6 for 2, still some headroom left. Of course, overall, you, you see, I sit relatively high in the vehicle and the roof line is low due to aerodynamics. So as a tall person, you feel a little bit lost in a way that you can see here. Uh, this is like, you know, almost in my, in my line of sight, you know, it's still okay. I can see everything in the front just from this, you know, from this feeling. Tesla now co calls it cocoon feeling that you kind of surrounded also by this ambient lighting and so on. And this new steering wheel is another thing. First of all, completely new design and it feels even more gaming alike, I feel. Also, no stalks here at all here. These are the turning indicators. You just press it. You also get something of a haptic feedback when you press it. So that's also good. So I really would like to know how it works while driving. We did test it with the Tesla Model S and the Tesla Model X. It has pros and cons. You clean up everything in a better way, in a way. Um, sometimes controlling them while you turn the steering wheel can be a problem like in a roundabout or something. But overall, of course, a very clean solution and I like to have some kind of feedback there. You will control the steering wheel once again from this infotainment system. We're also going to take a look at the cockpit here very soon because there are more changes. First of all, soft touch also for the rear. We rarely find that in other vehicles in this segment, definitely also once again the ambient lighting. Then biggest change are again the seats also with the perforation and this perforation has a passive cooling effect, yes, but for the front seats, you can even have an active cooling. That's, of course, very good for hot summer days. When I'm driving and I'm sitting here as a tall person, I can also sit in the rear. I still have some legroom left here, so that works. Um, to put the, my shoes under the seat, I would need to lift the front seat a little bit. And headroom-wise here with this new seating, it also works but comes close. So when you're really tall, you feel that the ceiling is actually quite low with the vehicle, can't deny that. Come closer here because there's more news. Eight inch screen now as standard for all models here for the rear passengers. And here you can control the vents digitally like this. So there's a new comfort feature and also where the vent strength is coming from. And of course, you'll be able to watch auto fuel then in your Model 3 here on the rear bench. That's the most important thing. And let's see here the seat heating control. It's for the rear seats. The rear seats not cooled, but heated. And that's, of course, also a cool thing. This 15.5 inch screen is basically the same. However, the bezels are smaller, so you have less frame all around. That's also a good improvement. And the typical Tesla software, of course, the great thing is here, IA Motor, this responsiveness to the hardware behind the system is great. So that's also one of the cool things. And here, 
heat and cool. You can switch that. You cannot do it at the same time, but this is then the heating or cooling effect for the front seats. And there's also this easy access directly. You don't have to go that deep in the menu. You can directly access here like the normal climate unit. I'm always a fan of real climate unit and real climate knobs. So that's maybe one catch. But then again, it cleans up the interior, of course, also bring the cost down. I also like this, this fabric layer here on top of that. Brings more luxurious feeling to the vehicle. Feels also really good. On top of that, once again, soft touch leather red. Here also soft touch, so the premium build quality has been lifted indeed. Also reworked charging pads with microfiber inserts for two inductive charging at the same time. Well, the only thing is it's not cooled, so smartphones may get hot. Then you have here the middle console to be opened, more space, adaptive cup holders and also coolers here. This middle armrest, I feel they have improved the build quality also here when it snatches back. It's like an, almost like a magnetic snatch here. It's really interesting. So I feel they have improved the Tesla Model 3 build quality over time. They have addressed almost everything I criticized in the past. The only thing I can really find is, you know, here, you know, when you're really tall, you feel like you're almost sitting inside a seating. It works with the headroom, but just the feeling you get there, you know, that might be the only critical thing for tall people, but especially here, this increased seating comfort from the seat. That is the most crucial change. To me, the most crucial update to the Model 3 so far. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really surprised what they did here with this vehicle and only put up the price 1,000 euros. We hardly see that in the automotive industry. So yes, a lot has been done by other manufacturers, but it seems to be also here in this, for European size, mid-size, for maybe US compact size, in this very segment here from the sedans, Tesla is back, obviously. Of course, they were never gone in a way. The Kia Niro in the new generation is still available as hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and as the all-electric version, the Kia Niro EV. That is the crucial version we're gonna take a detailed look on. Today, here with Thomas and Autofuel for you with this one. Let's go! A strong appearance here in the front. This Kia Niro has definitely matured with the new generation. Contrasting look, especially if you pick that white color. The charging flap, by the way, is right here in the front already. Talk more about charging and the EV range later on. And do they offer as a franc? Yeah, they do. Let's take a look here. Small, but definitely helpful. To open the charging flap, right here in the front. There we go, AC and DC charging, but only up to 80 kilowatt. And that means more than 40 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. And why is that? They are not using the 800 volt technology they use in the Kia EV6. This is more like 18 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. Here, of course, more than double the length. So they are not planning this one here to have this fast autobahn recharges and so on. It also is about the battery, 65 kilowatt hours net, even more deals and later in the driving part. With four meters 42 or 174 inches, this new generation has grown about seven and a half centimeters or two and a half inches in length and could be a competitor lengthwise to a VW ID3 or a Renault Megane EV and also internally to the Kia EV6. The EV6 more has the sporty focus, whereas this one here rather has this practicability approach, you know, higher building style, more space on the interior considering the length. The EV6, of course, a little bit longer. So different approaches here also, not the charging and range emphasis that is more again with the EV6. These are some of the differences already. You can see is more an SUV style now and here 17 inch wheels also with this rather aerodynamic styling and the nice silver shiny contrasting here once again working very well with the white and black frames although the lower part here is just a very simple material but everything looks kind of rugged and also you can pick a contrasting color here but I wouldn't really say that's necessary is it if you look really close you can see these vortex generators and then there is a real gap in there behind this so-called air blade and then the air is exiting here at the rear and you can see there is indeed a gap 
I really like the front and the side styling, but in the rear, I think it seems a little bit off. Is it maybe just too much or what's your take on that? Vertical tail lamps and here, a lot of different elements here and there. Maybe just too much indeed. Top speed is 170 kilometers an hour or 100 miles per hour. We're gonna try that out on the German Autobahn here for you today. And 7.8 seconds, the acceleration here for the EV. I told you earlier, there's also a hybrid available and a plug-in hybrid, so still combustion engines in that mix, but the electric version is meanwhile actually becoming more and more important in that model lineup. The keyless entry here when you press that knob and the door closing sound. Interesting, I would say, hmm, it's not that, you know, it doesn't sound that super much premium, but also not bad. It has a very unique sound, doesn't it? Inside of the doors, here with nice materials, this is soft touch, also has a structure. Actually also build quality, very nice here from the buttons and so on. This area here, it does have some kind of surface as well, kind of like a structure, but I think, I mean, they meant well, but it can also have association with it, that it, you know, looks like there would be stains on it, but they're not, you know what I mean? Harman Kahn sound system, a nice option with a cool sound. And this interior is really interesting. First of all, the steering wheel, kind of similar to the one from the EV6. We also have the drive mode selector directly at the steering wheel here and real buttons at the steering wheel. Here for the cruise control, for example, or for scrolling in the digital instruments, the right side to pick next song, and also here for the volume. That's awesome indeed. We'll take a deep look also at the instruments and the infotainment system. You see here when they shut off, they form this one black unit. And the seats are also particularly interesting. So base versions in some markets starts with fabric. And here, these ones are the leatherette seats and they contain so-called tensile. This is a material that contains natural fiber, so also reducing the um, CO2 impact even further. And it feels rather slick. It has this perforation because it's also combinable with the seat ventilation. And it has a very own unique feeling to it, a very nice and modern look and also very interesting feeling. So way to go Kia and this whole interior is actually animal free. The steering wheel as well, way to go. So Kia is really showing the competition how to build attractive and animal free interiors, which are also using less resources and have less harm in production and so on. So once again, thumbs up. And also as for the comfort here, comfort feature that when you put the ignition, can we say ignition with the combustion engine? What do you guys think? <laughs> so the seating position here, now when I'm driving, really comfortable in these seats. They hold you tight, they're somewhat sporty as well. Again, the surface is nice, the ergonomics behind it is also top notch. And with 189 or 6 foot 2, I have a lot of headroom left, no problem at all. So very comfortable seating position, somewhat already crossover SUV alike. And the steering wheel goes in and out, up and down. Yeah, some resistance. It could maybe come a little bit more towards me, but overall it's totally fine. So even as a tall person, you can drive very, very comfortably here. And this also the thing about the vehicle, it offers decent comfort. Decent is, I can, it offers great comfort indeed. Yeah, decent was just like, you know, uh, underestimate, so, so to speak. And also great roundabout visibility. Talk about that while driving as well. So when you're sitting here, you exactly know what's happening around you, even without assistant systems. Interior overview, two times 10.25 inch screens. And then this top part here is also soft touch and has a nice structure to it indeed. Clean cockpit layout. At the same time, we still have things to touch, to turn. So not only hashtag capacitive BS, and that's a crucial thing to me in this cockpit. For example, this lower unit, this can either be the AC unit where here you can control then the temperature with this knob, or when you press it here, then you basically cancel the whole thing. Here also AC on and off. When you switch it around here, then this is hotkeys like in the Kia EV6 to like access the map. And this one becomes the volume knob. So 
Interesting solution, definitely. I rather keep it with the climate thing because I control the volume at the steering wheel. USB-C charging and USB-A connector for your Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. An inductive charging pad. Then this is where you turn on the vehicle. Here, really nice seat heating, seat cooling, separate buttons also for the steering wheel heating. And really great to have a little red seat ventilation combination. That's awesome, especially for summer and for winter, of course, with the heated steering wheel. This is a drive selector for putting in here D mode or then reverse and neutral or here for park. And here separate buttons also for the co-driver side, for the passenger side. So really easy to use. Leatherette armrest here, you could put it up and yeah, it could be maybe a little bit better attached, some space underneath there and then a lot of space here actually in this area and then you can have this magic woo, bang, <laughs> these couples that fall out, they don't hold bottles super tight uh, but at least they are somewhat flexible in the usage of the space there. You can also get a head-up display for this vehicle here to have the speed and speed limits in your line of sight. Digital instruments, what you can do is here, change the middle view, then we can also see some consumption figures. This is more with city driving, this is more with motorway driving, so the consumption then is a little bit higher. And here you can see some animations as well as only the digital speed in here. And when you put in the driving modes, like here sport mode, ooh, it changes. So uh, have some nice visualizations then here too. Infotainment system is not super fancy, but well, it does the job, it's fast enough. You can have some views here of the internal things. There's also this digital climate unit, for example, but you rather would use than the unit below here. And when you go to the car internal GPS, yeah, it is somewhat usable. It has still this strange grappling hood effect here. Um, it can be helpful that you set a destination and so on for quick charging, but then it's also not the most important thing with this vehicle here. Most of the time you will still use the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto integration. And um, let's just take a look at here. This is how the Google Maps looks right in there. And let's just listen to music. This Harman Kardon sound system is of course nice for music lovers like I or like me. But I have to say, I have heard better sound from Harman Kardon in cars. Um, here, the thing is, usually the bass is in most cases turned up too much. In this case, the system indeed can use some more bass, which you can then set in the equalizer. And here at the passenger seat, look at that button. This is the folding flat button and you have to press it twice and then here, there we go. Um, yeah, goodbye. I'm gonna have a nap right now. It's really relaxing, quite nice, maybe for a charging stop as well. Uh, it doesn't work here with the driver's seat. So, in the um, EV6 on the Ionic 5, as I remember, both seats are possible for that. Here, just the passenger seat. So, um, yeah, as driver, of course, you stay a little bit more active than here. Are we still rolling? And you can turn the back part even further flat, by the way. So that way here, it's almost all the way flat. Rear seating here then with some hard pack at the inside of the doors. Same cool seat material. It's actually yeah, decently comfortable. Headroom works also for tall adults. Also the leg room here. It's not plentiful, but it's also not a long vehicle, so uh, I could, for example, put the seat a little bit more upright and then it would be even better. So they are using the space quite well, actually. The bench maybe could be a little bit longer, but again, we have to think about the segment here. And what you can also do is here change the back part. So let's see, this would be the steepest position. Then you can also put it more backwards. Nice solution here for USB seat charging in the rear integrated in the seats and we also have completely ev flat floor that's the thing it is available as combustion engine but then again they are all front wheel drive and so here you sit in the middle and can also easily sit so yeah this car can house five tall adults indeed and then here putting this one down cup holders not adaptive though to open the trunk press the button here at the key fob you can also stand behind the vehicle with the key in your pocket and then it automatically opens after a couple of seconds or classic this 
button press here and then we have this trunk area 475 liters the biggest in the ev version indeed and here the cabin trolley let's see as it fit in the vertical way that would work as well this top cover is a little bit like flying wobbling around not ideal i would say the width however good with a meter or 40 inches the length more like 80 a little bit over 80 centimeters or 31 inches and below here you can still store charging cables that's also quite good reaching over here and we can also fold the seats from here there we go uh, you can see when i have set the driver position and it's going backwards by this automatic comfort function then it's too far behind but to the passenger seat here uh, it's 165 meters or 65 inches for the height i removed that cover here at 70 centimeters or 28 inches this is thomas's driving lounge with the kia nero ev and we start here on the test the germanish test on a german autobahn our famous motorway from 40 kilometers an hour when we put it to the sport mode let's go One hundred. One fifty. And soon we'll reach the top speed, which is here at around, let's say, come on, come on, come on, come on. One hundred seventy four, one hundred seventy five kilometers an hour. So we're, yeah, something at one hundred miles per hour top speed, and it's reasonably silent here and considering it's not a super high class premium vehicle here lane change nice behavior also at higher speeds although it's not in a sporty setup oh there's a kia ev6 one more lane change here long band good in control nice feeling also in the steering wheel and now here maximum recuperation is from here and when i then use more brakes then the rear leg brakes are being applied as well so that was actually quite good autobahn behavior. Always shows the quality of the vehicle, definitely. Also when it is not being done every day, what I do here now. So now back to the normal driving mode. Also the visualization changes here. And yeah, normal motorway speeds, it's really quite silent in here. So good noise insulation and this upright seating position here, which is SUV-like definitely. It's really very comfortable in here and the seats do a great job this we talked about the surfaces earlier the seat form they hold you tight also at these higher speeds it's really very well done as for the whole seating position in the vehicle now we're in the tunnel you can see more of these instruments how they look like in the dark also the lower console here you immediately feel at home in this vehicle when driving it that's actually the very very cool thing about it that's that's what i really love and also when we hit the tunnel here it's very loud it's not too loud in here though the acceleration is pretty strong especially in here in the sport mode where there's more throttle input <sighs> directly get a boost that's really nice the steering feel let's see the differences here sport mode eco's a little bit softer normal also yeah, you have a little bit more feedback in the sport mode that is actually good and you can also hold it then for the snow mode where the acceleration then is also decreased a little bit so i really like the steering feel and we also have assistance systems we'll do that on the turn when we go back the motorway okay we'll take you this one here because it's take a little bit too much time so we get off the motorway <laughs> yeah sorry about that that's a german thing so and then here <laughs> getting off the motorway now i'm hitting the brakes the lane assist is being deactivated it is a lot of fun actually again it is not set on a very sporty note but still a lot of fun these electric vehicles when the batteries on the bottom of the vehicle brings down the center of gravity and therefore also not so sporty vehicles Let's say not obvious sporty we could still feel sporty and fun to drive that's actually a big advantage only and that we will do later when we have some narrow winding corners then of course more weight that's just a physical thing is pushing you out of the corners and then you feel the disadvantages of this weight 
it is an ideal city EV to me. Question is, of course, what do you consider a city EV as for the size? But I think the cool thing about this vehicle is it is short enough, but it's not too big. You can house a lot of different persons <laughs> and luggage in here. You can do. You, you can actually have it as a primary vehicle as for the usability. When you drive more in the city and at lower speeds and also use or maybe topography changes, use the recuperation effect a little bit more, less high speed, then the range can go up, it can do, go down like 17 kilowatt hours and one kilometers. Um, that's more a real world range of maybe like three, 380 kilometers or um, some 240 miles. That is possible assist and systems. I put in the active cruise control and the active lane keeping assist. And this is 80 here. Why is it guy pulling behind me? I'm not sure. Yeah, some people I know want to live their rage on the road. I only do that when I have when I'm facing no me. <laughs> you check that out in the Neo episode. If not, then you should do that later. So here the active lane keeping assist works in a quite smooth way. You see here, not sudden steering interventions. Keeping the lane, although we have this left bend here, there is also a blind spot monitor. I'm not sure if you, um, you've you just seen that in the side mirror. I don't know, did you see that actually? No, but I mean, there's like this triangle in the left mirror when, when this disappears. So back to the sport mode and from 80 kilometers an hour, let's go. Still have a punch. Nice, 150. Now we're going over overtake. We'll take that road back. <laughs> so now we reach top speed again and it is surprisingly relaxing and calming driving this one here at higher speeds, although when you look at it from the outside, you wouldn't uh, really think it is, you know. So, very good behavior. They have extremely good hardware in this one. And they're not even adaptive dampers in this one. And the suspension is doing a great job. And I don't even feel like I have to lift my foot off the throttle. I could also drive this car at super high speeds for a longer period of time. It's absolutely, absolutely you know, no problem, you know. Recuperation, by the way, I can sit here on the shifting pedals I can set it here stronger 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 and also to the max now I'm, I'm not braking that's all the recuperation or I can use the right pedal and go to zero recuperation then the car is just rolling 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 huh. <laughs> so you can choose that and when you restart the vehicle the settings are also more or less kept but not the eye pedal so that's when you put the strongest recuperation and reset the vehicle that's not being safe because this has to do with homologation, where they register for these driving cycles, and yeah, that's why they they can't save every mode. Basically, it's a little bit annoying. And when you um, hold the pedal, by the way, then it goes to the auto mode, and that's also an interesting compromise. That here, when nothing is in front of me, car is rolling. But if there would be a car in front of me, then there's more recuperation or regenerative braking. So that is also something you have to find your own favorite setting basically and um, you can argue for one pedal driving peaking you can argue for more rolling with a little recuperation you can argue for the adaptive recuperation and at the end of the day it depends on what you like best actually and where you feel best and safest with actually so I'm rating out here from the traffic light yeah <laughs> some tire, tire uh, noise there in the front front wheel drive of course, it doesn't feel that sporty when accelerating out because it is front wheel driven. But still, I mean, as long as you don't accelerate out of the corners, it feels really nice. Of course, you more have this being pulled feeling than being pushed from the rear. That's what sporty drivers really appreciate. This is here, let's go back to the normal mode. This is here a good test for the cruise control and the um, lane keeping assist once again. Let's see so far here. Of course, I'm really careful with this truck facing me now. So far, also when it gets a little bit more curvy, it's, um, yeah, it's actually fine. Sometimes I do feel that the transitions, when you turn off that thing, then you feel it's, you know, 
that's not that that clean from a transition actually and you have a, you know I have these real button controls of the steering wheel so the user interface while driving to me is excellent for example and here I just press on this button once and then the active lane keeping assist is off even if I have the cruise control set the only thing that is still active is this runoff road protection and uh, this cannot be deactivated that easily just with a with knob here at the steering wheel um, yeah that's maybe the, the only thing that could be annoying at times um, yeah and that you can just driving mode here that is also more sports car like so I really liked it and you're changing the temperature while driving so easy because we still have that knob or if you want to change the volume there showed you earlier you can do that but I usually change the volume then here on the steering wheel that's an easy solution and very important when you just turn around this car has an excellent overview to all of the sides so even though there are so many assistance systems nowadays a good classic overview from the inside looking to the outside is priceless and that's another reason I really love driving this vehicle this is such a good vehicle to use just day and day and day and day out one more time to the sport mode and let's put it in some corners also rough terrain you know suspension has to work you feel there are no adaptive dampers but still suspension is doing a quite good job I think now here steering wheel once again nice accelerating out of the corners of course yeah not that sporty because I have the front wheel drive only and yeah also here maybe you heard that as well that the luggage is flying around in the rear so the luggage compartment obviously has like the fabric there is quite slippery yeah now you heard it yeah so the fun is a little bit limited by the front wheel drive so rear wheel driven EVs are more fun here but from the driving dynamics it's really nice and it doesn't feel too heavy at all so it's still a lot of fun to put it in the corners just the accelerating out factor that is as I said better with the rear wheel driven EVs but overall yeah really very very good in all the different driving aspects here we go with a driving review of the Kia EV6 German Autobahn included here with Thomas and Autogefühl is it better than the sibling Hyundai Ioniq 5 and is it maybe even the best EV overall now let's find out let's go thanks by the way to the Heinen dealership in Germany for supplying us the vehicle we do not get any money but I wanted to return the favor because they're really nice guys so check out the video description and the pinned comment for the link especially our friends in Germany they can then buy this vehicle for example at them so let's take a look at the front right here headlamps LED standard optional dual LED which we also see here now and also this very cool daytime running light right there this is the GT line that means we have different styling in the lower part a sportier atmosphere otherwise you would have a front grille which is more like curved like this in the lower part here more sporty accentuations on the side and also this lower element here overall a very cool and clean look new Kia logo there as well and the red color also fits the vehicle very well doesn't it The length here is at 4 meters 68 or 184 inches and the interesting thing is the Hyundai Ioniq 5 is basically the same platform same technology vehicle but here the Kia EV6 has a little bit shorter wheelbase but a little bit more overall length but they're just tiny nuances actually but very interesting in the driving part especially and also what the interior part is to come I will talk about the differences Kia EV6 and the Ionic 5 here the wheels 19 inch you should also stick with these tell you later on more about it in the driving part option you can also get 20 inch or 21 inch for the GT the most powerful version talking about that this one here today is the one with rear wheel drive you can also get all-wheel drive and you have two electric motors and the GT has two electric motors and the highest horsepower figure and there are also two different batteries available 58 kilowatt hours or 77 kilowatt hours we have the bigger battery here today and considering the overall range it is also recommended to go for the bigger battery at this moment soon also more about the range figures here in the side profile once again very streamlined look it's a little bit more wind efficient than the Ionic 5 because of this rear ending here some flying element right there very strong 
hip area here and also we have these adaptive door handles they also go in and out depending on if the car is open or closed wow look at that rear styling here with the light strip really impressive so super cool design i think very unique definitely and also very clean in the lower area here the gt line once again with the sporty black accentuations here as for the acceleration figures with the small battery and the rear electric motor only so we will drive only you start around 8.5 seconds then you go 7.3 with this one here big battery and rear wheel drive then you go 5.2 with the all-wheel drive version and 3.5 with the all-wheel drive GT. And here by the way with the remote park function you can actually move your car with the key so you hold it then here forward button and then it so I'm not driving you know <laughs> as you can see obviously and then you can move it out out of a, like a parking lot or something which is super narrow or so and the same way goes then also in uh, reverse so a pretty cool feature definitely so how far you want to go <laughs> let's put it in a nice review position again right not hits at Porsche there how does it work by the way so you have to press and hold this button first then the car comes to life and then you hold one of these two buttons um, sometimes it also doesn't work at first instance for me. I had that with Hyundai and also with the Genesis vehicles. Sometimes you need to try some sometimes and the car needs to be closed for that before. Interestingly hidden is here the charging flap. Wow, that's cool, right? And you also have a charging meter right here. That's nice. 11 kilowatt AC and then 240 kilowatt DC charging here. So you can go from 10 to 80 percent state of charge in under 20 minutes. However, only when the battery is already warm, when you have powered this car on the motorway. And then you have the V2L, the vehicle to load adapter. So kind of reverse charging here. You put it in and then you have this flap here. And then there's a normal, you know, cable charger in here so you can have your laser equipment maybe like standard pedaling board you want to charge there with that or some I don't know camping equipment whatever you like charging batteries for cameras really cool solution definitely by the way to unlock it again you have to unlock it at the front door at the inside of the doors then press the unlock and then you can put it out again you can see the door handles they are one with the vehicle when you close it and here when you open it they come towards you then a little bit and from the feedback here actually quite good and door closing sound solid and towards the interior here somehow soft at the inside not too soft here is then a little bit softer for your elbow actually controls for the mirrors and so on rather classic that's good and then yeah it seems really clean and nice that interior here soon more to this dual screen setup also interesting materials being used here so structured material that looks quite fancy steering wheel open spoke design still some manual buttons here on that really love that no capacitive bs you know hashtag capacitive bs is a thing here at autogefuel but no thing of that here at the steering wheel drive mode selector also here and then the seats they have this two color design right here. In this case, they are the ones with microfiber. They are the most comfortable, the coziest ones actually. And they can even be cooled. So microfiber plus cooling, best summer setup, really cool. They are available in different colors, showing you here also from the US configurator, for example. You can get a bright leatherette, a black leatherette, but then also combinations of black plus white or white plus black and also this microfiber variant and then there's also the GT the bucket seat and in Germany there's also a fabric entry level seat but the good thing is the whole interior is animal free sustainable materials no animal was harmed really good looking forward and also better than the Ionic 5 Ionic 5 does not have an animal free steering wheel and also the EU versions of the Ionic 5 had have animal leather, whereas this one here does not. Ionic 5 in the US has leatherette, but here completely and also in all markets. So way to go Kia in this respect. And the materials feel really sophisticated, extremely good. Again, for the comfort, 
the microfiber seat will be the best. Brings some more coziness in the interior, but the leatherette surfaces also feel really high class. And if you want to have this wiping clean effect or something, or like it more from the visual aspects, it's also totally fine. As for the position here, with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1, there's enough headroom left. It's a very comfortable seating position, and I feel the seats are also a little bit more comfortable than in the Ionic 5. Um, maybe a little bit. Um, the Ionic 5, you also have this uh, this lounge seat thing that you have an additional, um, you know, calf rest here, some some kind of thing. But here you have something um, similar. So when you use this button here in the lower area, then you do not have that special, you know, lengthenment there, there. But goodbye. <laughs> you at least also have this lying back position. Interior overview, really clean atmosphere, two times 12 inch screens, two more details of that, and more of that structure right here. That's cool. Also, more coming up in the lower console. This is a very interesting solution. Steering wheel here, up and down, in and out, very smooth transition, and recuperation is changed with the pedals right here. More to that in the driving part. And the digital instruments, right side the range, left side then the speed. Of course, battery is at the moment at 62%. And the consumption figure can be lower. This is like winter time and also hitting more acceleration pedal. I had um, you know, an average that was a little bit lower before. Zoom more to the effective range in the driving part. You can um, switch around here a little bit, but not too much to switch here actually. It changes a little bit according to the driving modes like this here, for example, in the sport mode. And then there's a head-up display. It's also clear to read. And it's very good to have that head-up display because here with that steering wheel, it doesn't appear like that on camera, but from my head position and how I have the steering wheel set, I have very often a view of the speed like this, you know. So the speed is then kind of half blocked by the steering wheel. So I tend to observe the speed then rather in the head-up display. Oh, by the way, here the heated steering wheel is really strong and also goes to the top part area here. Very nice and cozy for winter times. And here to that screen, well, this is a very modern vehicle and this is just okay, you know. Um, it is a touchscreen, but it still has the feeling of a couple of years ago, you know. You have also a digital climate menu here, but you don't really need it. Soon showing you why. Yeah, and uh, um, you know the GPS and also the map. I think this is a little bit disappointing, you know. Um, this is outdated in comparison to what this car otherwise can actually offer. So if you compare it to the Tesla Model Y and the Ford Mustang Mach-E, which both have cool infotainment systems, this one here does not. Usually then you would go for the Apple CarPlay or the Android Auto. And it's a cool remix, by the way. No, and he doesn't ha <laughs> ha um, program the sounds here for Kia, just for BMW. Well, the thing is here, yeah, good sound system as well. Nice to listen to that. And then to this interesting lower area, first of all, some ambient lighting here. And then I would usually leave it like this. You have still a real knob for the climate unit. Yes, way to go, even two zone AC here. That's very cool. And you can also activate, deactivate the AC here. This is then the additional heating directly from the battery. It takes energy, but sometimes in winter you do need it, definitely. It does have a heat pump, by the way, on offer. Then that is, you know, that reduces the range effects in winter, like the range losses. Here, you can then either hit this button or the upper one. It doesn't matter which one of these two fields you hit, and then it switches around. So, and then you have this hotkey menu for like the, the set nav or something, and this one becomes the volume knob. However, I mean, it's a cool, interesting idea to have both functions on that. Looking forward to your comments about that, but I would usually leave it in that way. Why? I want to control the temperature and the volume. I can also do on the steering wheel. And when I have Apple CarPlay and Auto in the infotainment system, then I use it everything here with touch and don't need the hotkeys right here. So this is it for me and probably I will not use the switch effect. Would you? Here, you can see how it switches. <laughs> here in the middle. Quite funny, isn't it? <laughs> And this is also easy to control, like the seat cooling and also heated steering wheel for winter time. Really cool. And also, by the way, efficient. It's more efficient to use heated steering wheel and heated seats than to heat up the whole air in the vehicle. This is the start stop button. 
and the gear shifter here for reverse or drive mode or for parking. As for the lower middle console, here left side USB-A, right side USB-C and then you have this open area right there. And I have the cable then, the long cable running around here. And there are special holders for that right here, you can see that. And then I put my smartphone here, that's, uh, that's actually on the inductive charging pad, but I don't use inductive charging because for Apple CarPlay and Android Auto you need the cable anyway, and with the cable also is faster charging. Then cup holders, adaptive, so they really thought about details, this is then the inductive charging pad, which I'm not using because I have the cable connection, and then a lot of space here also in the middle console. No middle tunnel, using that EV platform very well, that's how it's supposed to be. And we also have this nice black and white, trim here with the microfiber. Inside of the doors at the rear, however, this is then hard. There's lots of space. Look at that. How much legroom I have here. And it's like the mid-size um, vehicle. The length is compared to like a Mercedes C-Class, for example. And this is like astonishingly really good. Mm, the seating area here, the bench is not the best, I would say. You see here um, the angle of my knees, not the best actually. Headroom wise works once again with one with A6 or 6 with 1, so you have a lot of space, but not, it's okay the seating position, but not the best. Let's take it that way. Easily move around here also to the middle seat, so you can really easily go here. This seat is a little bit more backward at the moment, but you can go with three tall adults here. That's no problem actually. I also think it's the outer each and you can also vary the angle here of the seat here, make it more upright or push it a little bit further in. And then in the middle part here, you have cup holders. They are not adaptive though. Trunk area, something around 500 liters. It's not too different than the one of the Ionic 5. So here the length barely a meter or 40 inches and the width here also about a meter or 40 inches. Interesting is of course always the overall height right here which is about 70 centimeters or 28 inches. Here the cabin trolley hardly fits in the vertical way. Yeah that does fit by that. Here this thing does also fit over that so that's still okay and you have this easy access to the trunk. Here below yeah, that could also work for a charging cable. And what's really nice, <laughs> I'll reach over here. So that way and that way you can release the seats and then you can load the things through. Easy solution. And you see they fold really flat. By the way, they are also fixed then. You have to release them right here. And again, then you can uh, fold them up again. Need two hands for that. And do we have a frunk? See here, gas struts. And then there's this additional cover. Yay. It's actually quite well usable for a charging cable and whatever, so uh, around 50 liters. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge here with the Kia EV6 and you know, I'm a very German <laughs> reviewer and this is the most Germanish test for all the vehicles we have here. German Autobahn, the motorway. Let's go to the sport mode and you can see also the speed goes red. And this is the rear-wheel drive version with a big battery. We accelerate out from 40 kilometers an hour. Let's see when we have clear road. Next vehicle will pass and then let's go. One twenty. Yeah. So we had to cancel here for security reason, but that was 40 to 120. Really good. And now let's do another because now there's free again. 100 kilometers an hour when we're already at speed, accelerated out. So, 150. And now let's see if we can go top speed. Let's see what top speed we can score here. So now we should be able to reach like 100, 180. Yeah, it goes a little bit further. 180. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> Goes even further. Wow. 191. So almost 200 kilometers or 125 miles an hour. Pretty nice. And the rear drive version you've seen here is enough acceleration wise. You know, um, the all wheel drive version is two seconds quicker in the acceleration. And the GT all-way drive would be almost four seconds quicker than um, just uh, you know uh, three and a half seconds. So yeah, it's you know around three something, five something, and seven something. 
seconds. That's like the, the steps for that. But definitely more than enough here. And the good thing is when you have the rear-wheel drive only, yeah, it might be worse for really like snowy weather conditions and so on. But then again, when you get out of the corners, it's definitely more fun because you have just the rear-wheel drive. That's the cool thing here. Now the tunnel here, that's cool. With some ambient lighting, you can see it also here in the, um, in the lower middle console here. Pretty nice also then here. I really like that. So this gives atmosphere. Let's see, let's go to the normal mode. Well, I would have suspected maybe changes with the driving mode, but it doesn't. Um, that would have been cool, actually, but yeah, very nice. And as for the driving modes, for example, in normal mode, you have softer steering. And when you are in the sport mode, not only the throttle pedal is reacting more sensitively, but here the steering also gets a little bit stiffer. Overall, a very good steering feeling. Um, in the normal mode, Maybe it's a little bit too soft for me, so I like the steering feeling in the sport mode better. It gives just more accurate control of the car, I feel. Very important here is the suspension. And this is also the only thing I found better in the Aonic 5 in comparison to the EV6. So I talked to the suspension tester before and he said actually, yeah, they did a lot of special tweaks with the suspension to make it sportier and yeah I mean this is the case needed it feels really nice and agile has a little shorter wheelbase than the Ionic 5 sooner I'll also go in some S bends in some chicanes um, to test the agility of the car even more but when you're normal like city traffic or also motorway driving the suspension is less comfortable than in the Ionic 5 so that's the only catch really I could find with this vehicle in comparison to the Ionic 5. So to me, it's a little bit too stiff when you're driving over some bumps. That's also overall one of the very, very rare criticism factors I could find with this vehicle here today. So the most crucial thing when you pick this vehicle is stick with the smallest wheels possible. We have the 19 inch wheels here and it's already not that plush. <laughs> so. And when you go like 20 inch is an option or when you have the GT and 21 inch. No, no way. If you buy the Kia EV6, see, <laughs> that, hey, maybe should, they should have called the GT version Kia EV6. <laughs> like, yo, six speed, y'all. <laughs> Sorry about that. So if you, if you buy the Kia EV6, go with 19 inch wheels. You will thank me for that to have more comfort in everyday driving life. You see that sign there? That is the very famous German traffic sign for unlimited speed. Plop. We went from 80 kilometers an hour. Let's put the speed one more time. And listen to the noise insulation and it's really good. Now at 150 kilometers an hour, wow. Extremely good. The sound insulation and the, you know, you can literally also feel the wind efficiency. Um, so also in comparison to the Ionic 5, the Kia EV6 is a little bit more wind efficient. That's why the range figures will be also a little bit better. And noise insulation wise, this can easily keep up with German high class premium vehicles. I'm really surprised how silent this one is at high speeds. Wow, didn't expect that. I mean, I didn't expect it to be bad in any way, but this is really astonishingly good. And also indeed, way better than the Aonic 5. And the, the funny thing is, when I was driving this one in the city earlier at lower speeds, now with, that was 160 kilometers an hour, you know, that's like for Germans like, oh, okay, let's go to work. <laughs> so when you are actually driving in the city, I also already felt, wow, this is really cozy and silent. And this also brings me to the aspect back again Ionic 5 or Kia, Kia EV6, I would go for this one. As I said, the only thing I could find is the suspension is a little bit rougher. It's not that the Ionic 5 suspension would be the best and softest or something. They also do not have adaptive suspension available. But here, I think, due to the better noise insulation, um, here the climate control, with, which I can directly access while driving, I leave it that way. Once again, by the way, to use the climate knob here and the volume knob here at the steering wheel. That's a perfect setup. I do not need to switch it then around. So this 
it brings just a calmer feeling. The noise insulation is so, so good. Maybe also because we have the microfiber seats here that might also, you know, add a little bit more. And I said earlier, you have microfiber seats here and they can be cooled. This is the best setup for a super, super hot summer day. So I'm really impressed by that, you know. Very, very good to set up and of course animal free interior completely. So this package they put together here, super, super good. Two things are missing that are still quite crucial. Well, actually three. Assistant systems, recuperation and also more agile driving in very tight corners. Let's begin by the recuperation. So I set it to the max recuperation usually. It means I leave my foot on the throttle and then we have strong recuperation, one pedal driving feeling. So you can maybe most of the time leave out the brake pedal. The only thing is that when you start, start the car, it gets reset to the level three at least. Not sure why they do that. So here level three, level two, level one, or level zero. And when you have level zero and you leave your foot off the throttle, it just rolls and then you use recuperation via the brakes. It's not that there is less recuperation, it's just done via the brake pedal then and only when you need even more braking power then the real brakes of the vehicle are applied. Well, I tend to have the electric vehicles in maximum recuperation, but then, especially when someone is next to me, be gentle with the throttle, both in pressing and releasing it, because there's so much g-force applied. The electric vehicles are so fast, so spontaneous in the acceleration that it really takes a lot of the passengers then. So you need to learn driving the EVs properly, not to apply too much g-forces then to your passengers. And you can get accustomed to that pretty easily. It's a little bit like learning the clutch, you know, both in a car or uh, in the electric vehicle. Um, so, so both in cars and in motorcycles, I mean, um, just a feeling for that, you know, a very sensitive feeling in, in controlling that. As for the assistance systems, we may be seeing the blind spot monitor when we're on the motorway. Then you can also set cruise control here, left side of the steering wheel. So far, so good. Also has an active lane keeping assist that is predominantly working in, on the motorway and did so far a quite a smooth job. And of course, the agile driving, that is to come now at the very uh, later stages here of our driving part. But what about that concise range? Well, now there was like a super high speed motorway drive and so on. But earlier I did a longer normal test drive and we were scoring some 20, 21 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. So yeah, that's like some 27 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. It means we can, even here in winter times, come close to some 400 kilometers or 250 miles. When it's really cold and you use a lot of heating, then it will be a little bit less. However, when we now compare that to our driving test with the Ionic 5, indeed, some range advantages here for the Kia EV6. The consumption figure is indeed a little bit lower. And yeah, it's just the fact that the building style, the building form of this vehicle is a little bit better you know for the wind flow yeah very interesting because the rest of the technology the electric motors and so on battery they are actually all the same once again a little shorter wheelbase but a little more overall length than the ionic 5 and yeah it's strange on the one hand it feels a little bit sportier also due to the stiffer suspension setup and on the other hand you'd somehow feel there's more tail moving you know um, but overall, the interesting thing to me is also, although Ionic 5 and Kia V6 look so different on the outside, sitting on the inside, even though we have a lot of small advantages for this one here, they come very close. You feel the same platform. You feel they use the same technology. So they are coming closer in the feeling than I... In it, like 50 kilometers an hour speed limit here and actually like exactly on this point the police is frequently doing um uh, speed uh, speed camera uh, radar maybe i still much money <laughs> wants to pay some more to the police yeah <laughs>
Life and after Gefühl. So, indeed, Ionic 5, Kia EV6, they come close. In a way closer than I thought, but definitely all the small details we've been finding clearly says for me, this one here is the way to go in that comparison. So here you can see how the lane keeping assist keeps the car in the lane, even in a bend. Yes, keep your hands on the steering wheel, evil Thomas. <laughs> but also in a very smooth way, you know, like not with constant corrections and so on. So I'm really happy with that, actually. And it's not even the motorway here, and usually it works better on motorways. And these systems have more problems when you're not on the motorway. But And also like touching the steering wheel, it seems also be enough. Don't even have to con control it. Here now I, I help a little bit. That's yeah. I don't don't trust in it like 100%. You shouldn't yet. <laughs> Maybe in a couple of years. But let's see if this. I'm not steering. I'm not steering. Uh, okay, I'm steering. Um, <laughs> don't want to take the chances. But overall, you see in slight bends, it did actually a quite good job. But now, what about the sharper bends? We pull to sport mode once again, and here rough road. Yeah, there you feel that one disadvantage, that the sporty feeling of the suspension. Whoa, gets a little bit rough then in um, in the potholes. So that's not that good actually. But here, really fun in these bends. Oh, it's a little bit red road here as well. So um, nice acceleration out of the corners. Even ESC was on there in, in that respect. Interesting. So here once again, next left. Nice agile feeling. Oh, it's it's really you know regulating quite a lot when I'm here on the interesting. Let's see, traction control disabled. Ah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So, but I mean it, it's a good thing to know that when you say oh it's rear wheel drive only is it like too slippery or something here now and. Yeah, there we go. When traction control is like on ESC Sport, I mean, it says traction control disabled. This doesn't seem to be like a like a step in between. Ah, there we go. Traction control and ESC disabled. Okay, that's when you hold it. So there are two steps in each. So <clears throat> the first thing, first thing is like an ESC Sport. So there's still some electronic regulation, but it, oh, I think we leave these trucks by. Let's see, so when you have the smaller car, always try to make way for the bigger ones because they can't move that much. So let's see, and we can also can test the rear view camera, which has a nice resolution. And you see that the car is also agile enough. There we go. Yeah, they were happy about that. <laughs> so always be nice to others on the road, then others will also be nice to you. Once again, we have some events coming ahead. It's really a lot of fun. Let me put it to EC Sport again. That was a lot of fun. So, really surprised that when the EC is on, and I was just slightly hitting the throttle, it was really like really limiting um, the power. So, but the good thing is when you think about ah, I go for rear drive only, maybe it gets too slippery in winter times or something. The electronic helpers are really in place, and they help you a lot by that. You know, so um, that's actually. A good thing because when you want to have it a little bit more loose then you can go in this ESC sport mode. ESC off of course I do not recommend for public roads at all that's not safe enough maybe just when you're in an empty parking lot or something but here a lot of fun in these bends and then yeah here we can also probably accelerate out but it's not that it would get out of control with the um, ESC sport mode or something really a lot of fun definitely more fun than the Ionic 5 Yeah, one of the most fun EVs here as well. So, fun factor, definitely also guaranteed here. But what about now when we think about the others, the other competitors, the others from not from Lost? <laughs> so, um, in our big EV comparison episode, maybe tune into that one if you haven't seen it yet. I was really rating the Tesla Model Y and the Ford Mustang Mach E. You know, very high. Tesla Model Y has better range, better efficiency, and more space on the interior overall. However, no head-up display and no instruments. The Ford Mustang Mach E, from the package it offers, comes very close to this one. It's very good all around, like everything you need. You know, like 
cool styling on the exterior, great driving fun, um, animal-free interior, has a great infotainment system, which you can better reduce even the car internal GPS. Hey, hey wait a minute. That's the problem here. Mainly Apple Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. So if a car internal GPS is important for you, the infotainment system is more modern and better with the Ford. That's the main difference between these two. And also the Ford sits higher. It feels more SUV-ish while driving. This one here, more crossover-ish. Not exactly the SUV feeling. And yeah, that felt a little bit better to me in the Ford, I think. However, both are very comfortable as for the seat ergonomics. That's also better here in the EV6 and in the Ionic 5, I feel, that the seat while driving is also more comfortable. And also here, this um, microfiber top surface makes the ride even a little bit plusher and cozier. So really very, very good. It's a very tough decision. So indeed, I have to say that my favorite three electric vehicles, you know, as for the ones that are somehow affordable. Of course, you can, there's like, like the BMW iX, which is an excellent electric vehicle, you know, but it's really big and extremely expensive. It won't matter to most customers, you know, or like the Mercedes EQS has, of course, better range, like a Tesla Model S, but not, that's not the segment we are comparing. We are comparing the segment, which is at the moment, not cheap, but more affordable like than the very high luxury SUVs. EVs. <laughs> or EV SUVs. So in this very segment here, definitely my top three are now the Ford Mustang, Ford Mustang Mach-E, the Tesla Model Y, and here the Kia EV6. In which order? That's a really tough question. So is it the best SUV? Here? Well, always mix them EV and SUV because there are a lot of EV SUVs here. <laughs> so is it the best EV at this moment? Hmm. Well, suspension could be a little bit more comfortable. Infotainment system could be a little bit better. Other than that, it's really, really good. You know, super comfortable. Range is also fine. Very silent. So for me, it would come down to if range is the factor for me, you still have to go for the Tesla Model Y and of course range in combination with their supercharging network. If that's the crucial thing, the Tesla Model Y still wins it. If that's not the crucial thing and you think like, ah, I don't want to drive without instruments or head-up display, then the Tesla is out. And then to me it's really between the Ford Mustang Mach-E and this one here, the Kia EV6. And which one of these? I would probably try to get uh, offers from dealers and see how they compare. I really like driving both. So um, to me, they feel kind of equal. The Ford Mustang Mach-E, the higher seating position, if that's more important to you, then that's maybe the thing. Here, this one here offers better fast charging when the battery is preheated. That might be an argument for that. Yeah, but overall, I think if it's the top number one EV, that really depends on the individual thing you, you need, but definitely among the best, no doubt. Today, a very Germanish review of the Hyundai Ioniq 5 here, the EV test with Autobahn and full speed. As Thomas and Autogefühl and I recommend to go full screen and watch full length. <laughs> Let's go. What people love so much about the Ionic 5 is the design. It has this retro style. At the same time, it looks modern. And everyone's thinking like, why hasn't VW gone in that direction? Why didn't they just put the Volkswagen Golf 1 design in an electric vehicle? Everyone would have wished that. They did not. Instead, Ionic or Hyundai put the Ionic 5 here in this really cool rectangular design. I just love it. LED standard for the main headlamp, and you can see here the daytime running light in this yeah, arcade 90s gaming style. That's really cool. And gravity gold is the color for today. Also had the white one at our earlier test. Also looks quite fancy. The length at 4 meters 63 or 182 inches. So it is actually a little bit longer than it looks. It looks like a smaller compact hatch. 
but actually not. So it really competes with the other mid-size EVs, mid-size for European taste actually, like the VW ID4 or the Tesla Model Y, for example, Ford Mustang Mach E, and later on in the driving part, I will also draw more comparisons and so on. 19 or 20 inch wheels, these are the 20 inch wheels, really large, more this like a closed aerodynamic design. If you want more comfort, go for smaller ones because there are no more sophisticated suspension upgrades to be bought here or something. Then these crossover wheel arches, again, these nice inserts here for this tech like technology style look the door handles here they fold out when the car is opened like at the moment or then they are actually you know just one with the chassis when they are closed and here strong c pillar once again kind of golf style wow and also that rear design i can just applaud hyundai for that again look at that we just love this retro you know computer game styling it's just awesome. So from all these competitors, I think the Ionic 5 and the Ford Mustang Mach-E, they just look coolest, don't they? Tell me your opinion in the comments. They have different models on sale. They have rear-wheel drive and also all-wheel drive models. Rear-wheel drive more goes into the eight seconds something acceleration figure. And here the all-wheel drive, the strong one, all-wheel drive model, 5.2 seconds in the acceleration figure. The charging flap is right here on the passenger side on the right and once again also here this design here when it's recharging is really cool DC charging up to yeah with the gloves it's <laughs> kind of tricky up to 220 kilowatts but the thing is it's just working when the battery is preheated so when you're speeding it on the motorway for quite some time and then go to the fast charging station then you have an advantage and really recharge really fast yeah, but the thing is when you go, especially in winter times, to a fast charging station and you haven't speed it in the motorway, then you score figures like these. I've tested it and then it's just, you know, like mediocre, like 70, 80, at some point in 100 kilowatt. And this is not such a big advantage then that you have this 800 volt architecture. So the only advantage really when you have went fast on the motorway, therefore the battery is already warm, then you can also enjoy this high charging speeds. At this point, this vehicle segment here i rather recommend to go for the biggest battery available because you will need the range at some point or might want the range and here in summertime about four kilometers or 250 miles with the 73 kilowatt hour net battery in winter times it can go down and more like 300 something kilometers or 190 miles something um, of course when it's really cold outside or also you use the throttle a little bit more you know this is the car key and when you open it see here folds out with the handles and close it fold in well, that's really nice and uh, on the key you also have here these park functions so we've tested it before and then you can also remotely park in and out your vehicle grabbing these handles is not the most practical thing to do door closing sound that is very nice mm, good sound and a very cool and bright interior here love that style and also high build quality soft touch here red contrast stitches very futuristic interior cleaned up really tidy from that design look at that here uh, you get fabric seats as base and then you can get also slick surface seats let's call them that way because the difference is when you are in europe these here are from animal skin which doesn't make sense for sustainable ev especially and in the us they are then high grade leather red. So obviously Hyundai thinks that people who love animals are only in the US and not in Europe. Very strange decision. However, what's really cool, look at that here. This is here for these, you know, this is like a 1,000, 1,500 euros option. And then you, um, you have these relax uh, package. And then for example here, and then you can also put that whole seat here backward you know like this and then you kind of have this relaxed lounge seat it works with the driver seat and the co-driver seat and then you can also here you know put that seat upward like this so and then overall they call it the zero gravity seat and you can do it with both seats and then maybe yeah start snuggling and here the passenger seat it also works here with the 
side control like this it slides backward first then then it goes like this it looks at like my hand would be doing this right and then also the front part goes up like this and now you have this yeah cinematic or snuggling setup with both seats yeah bright animal skin we have a problem the thing is there are new leather red materials we have a special video about that where this wouldn't be no problem at all here i cannot wipe it clean but with new high grade materials you can easily wipe it clean and it's no matter which color you pick ah <sighs> yes super relaxing indeed this is one of the unique features of this vehicle here wow and here now you can also see this really clean interior setup you can enjoy it even more um, just relax and yeah for example enjoy while the charging station is active and getting your vehicle ready to drive again so um, yeah just need the uh, second the driver or the uh, passenger driver then to enjoy together with you together well and the normal driving position is also decent steam wheel up down in and out a little bit no, with that with resistance in that steering column Hmm. Wasn't it VWC or Martin Wintercorn at that time wanting that this, their steering columns worked like the ones from Hyundai? Nowadays it's kind of like the other way around it seems. Yeah. Headroom like this, a lot of headroom still left with one with 86 or 6 with 1. The thing is here, seating position wise, this is not SUV. Maybe a little bit higher than a normal compact hatch or something. Rather crossover alike, but from the other competitors here rather a normal or lower seating position once again the clean setup two times 12.25 inch screens here and good build quality soft touch here this is also a nice area still a manual volume knob like that and here the glove box by the way it doesn't fold it slides open so this car indeed has a lot of unique features here on the right you can see the climate unit can be accessed very well it is hashtag capacitive bs though i would have wished for a manual climate unit but at least it's separated and you can easily access it however when you want to go for seat heating or the heated steering wheel you have to go here in the infotainment system and then here for the heated steering wheel or here for the seat heating that's definitely too complicated we used to know other things from hyundai that hyundai has the more simple user interface at least you can put one hotkey here for example and use it um, that it always jumps to the apple carplay or android auto there's the bose sound system inbuilt in this vehicle which gives us indeed a very crisp and clear sound so indeed like that and you can see here the carplay integration goes all the way over the screen that looks nice most of the time you will use it because here the inbuilt map is kind of old school and has this grappling hook effect from hyundai and kia or genesis and the normal gps the inbuilt ones are not that well usable so usually i would rely on the apple carplay android auto um, one that i have here these buttons for the volume control for example that's good to have it and here also for the cruise control i can set it here with hard buttons and good to have a drive mode selector directly on the screen not with turning but with pressing and then you can see how these digital instruments adapt to that who sports mode eco or normal and then you can also have you know some other displays in there but not a real map or something and you can also get a head-up display here with speed and loud speed and also some gps information yeah if the calculation would be ready at some point lower part usb a connector actually this is the only one that connects the smartphone connectivity the two further ones here are just for charging then you have an inductive charging pad there cup holders and what's interesting by the way when i put out the rubber thing here it says left hand drive so obviously there must be a unique right hand drive model which is then kind of like um, topsy-turvy or something interesting right and then here it's really interesting some more space underneath well you need some more cables because these cables here these multiple cables they work at every car i've tested just not here and it says the cable not supported and i've tested several ones so this car doesn't like any usb cable <laughs> so and then you can fold up this console have a lot of space here and even more interesting you can move that whole thing here you have to grab it here 
and then you can slide it backward or forward. And when you slide this middle console forward, by the way, you can see here you also have more space in the middle part than in the rear. And in general, also very nice setup here for the rear, very open atmosphere. Two USB A chargers there in the middle console, by the way. And then here the adjustments electronically, forward and backward. You can also do that remotely at these other dials there at the passenger seat or then manually for the inclination. And they are really using that EV platform a lot of space, although I'm driving as a tall person. So really spacious in the rear, a lot of headroom as well. Nice bright ceiling here as well. And then you can see here how you can change the inclination here in the manual way or go forward here to get a little bit more trunk length on demand or backward then for the most legroom. In the front you do have a trunk, however it's really really tiny. Speaking of tiny, 530 liters for that trunk and the thing is it's not especially high, that's the thing. So here to the cover it's really shallow, here the cabin trolley hardly fits underneath like this. They say they put this one here in a wobbly way that you can also like secure luggage like this, but hmm, yeah, you know. Here one meters or 40 inches in width, that's actually okay. The length here is almost one meter or 40 inches, so you can use it. And here the overall total height here, like this, about 74 centimeters or 29 inches. Below here, by the way, hardly any space for any cable. You rather have it flying around here or then put it in that very tiny frunk when the cable is small enough. Thompson's Driving Lounge, Ionic 5, German Motorway Autobahn. And here we put it to the sports mode. Woo. And then we'll do 40 kilometers an hour to, let's see. 100. One fifty. One eighty. And here we go. Top speed one knot, eighty-eight kilometers an hour. Yeah, very spontaneous acceleration, and yeah, of course, gets quite noisy in here, but not too loud and. Really stable here now at high speeds, very good to control also from that steering wheel. And let's see now I released the throttle about the recuperation. Yeah, strong recuperation definitely. And the engine is really good, I have good feeling over the car, very good handling indeed. 20 inch wheels are mounted here at this moment. feel quite sporty actually, so they make it definitely sportier. If you want more comfort, go for smaller wheels. Now of course the <laughs> energy consumption went up all the way. It is not the best vehicle for a higher motorway speed, as for the fuel, not fuel economy, energy economy of course. So um, the Ford Mustang Mach-E for example is more, when you like, say like 130 kilometers an hour, um, yeah, you know, like 70, 75 miles an hour, then the Ford Mustang Mach-E, for example, is more efficient than the Ionic 5. And the Tesla Model Y is also more efficient than this one here, the higher you go in speed. The um, range, summertime, and well, wintertime when it's not too cold and you don't hammer the throttle all the way, you can score some 400 kilometers or 250 miles, that's comparable to most of the other competitors. Just the Tesla Model Y is better in that respect because it is more efficient. And well, here now of course when we hammer it out on the motorway, the range drops down. In that sport mode is the maximum acceleration from that all-wheel drive, so front, cross, rear motor. And in general, you know, it's really spontaneous as for the throttle input and so on. Let's see here, steering feel. I can change it here on the steering wheel, the drive mode. Here the steering is lighter than in the normal mode, for example, and when I hit the throttle, it just has some more or less delay, you know. Delay as for this relation because still when you're in the normal driving mode, the electric vehicles still have kind of no delay and have <laughs> extreme spontaneous acceleration. So a lot of fun to drive. It also doesn't feel SUV-like, more like normal compact hatch alike or crossover alike. So from these EVs we have been testing, here the Hyundai Ionic 5 feels kind of less or the least SUV-ish. 
you know, thinking about the, um, uh, the the trio of VW ID4, Skoda Enyaq, and Audi Q4 e-tron, more like crossover SUV all in direction, the Ford Mustang Mach E. Mach E, you say then. In, it's really funny, by the way, because we say in Germany, it's like Mach. Mach. <laughs> yeah, so that one also already fits more SUV alike. Um, yeah, and then this one here, I mean, you see it from the outside, yes, and uh, a lot of people look at this car, by the way. So uh, the guys next to me now, <laughs> they're also watching us here at the moment, um, saying, like, what is this guy doing there? And oh, yeah. Is that a car review? Let's check it out, you know. Oh, they're hitting YouTube now. I see it. <laughs> yeah, what's up? <laughs> yeah, um, so this car is uh, getting the looks, definitely, because it has this modern retro design. Can we say it that way? Definitely, definitely is. So um, that's the, uh, a lot of fun uh, as well, of course, just to look at it. Here, by the way, when I use the turning indicator, you can see here is an additional blind spot feature. Then we have these cameras here. We know that from Hyundai, Kia, and Genesis vehicles, this feature is a very nice feature. And um, here on the steering wheel, by the way, we have also all the controls here, for example, for the cruise control and also for the lane keeping assist. But what's really cool is that here, when you use the turning indicator, for example, oh, this is so lovely. Just, you know, the feedback the turning indicator gives you. And also um, the thing, you know, like the, um, button around galvanizing it or here also the the shifting lever this is so great this is really a lot of fun when controlling this vehicle what is else? well that's very important the recuperation is being controlled here via the shifting pedals and here by the way now when the traffic light jumps to green there's like a left bend and we can put it to the sports mode once again it's really good to be able to change it here at the steering wheel Wow, spontaneous boost, and let's see it now accelerating out of the corner. Really smooth and super... There's no... <laughs> this, this is the fun thing about all-wheel drive electric vehicles. You look in the mirror and you think like, am I driving a motorcycle? Because, you know, with motorcycles, your motorcycle drives like... like bah, bah, or with, with electric... Yeah, for driven electric motorcycle, this is really fun as well, definitely. It's really cool. Um, you accelerate and you look in the mirror and it's like, where is everyone? And the same thing can happen with this one. Of course, it does not have to happen. You can also stay in the eco mode and the throttle input is being reduced, by the way. So here now, cruise control. Let's see also about the lane keeping assist. See that Steven is a little bit nervous as for that. So from competitors, we know Whoa, it's really nervous keeping the car in the lane. Whoa. Of course, it's meant to that you keep your hands on the steering wheel. I was like, Thomas, keep your hands on the steering wheel, please. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, really nervous lane keeping assist. So we've experienced that one definitely better. Now we can check once again what if we are at speed already. Let's put it to the sport mode once again. This is why we in Germany here today. Last time we were in Spain, Valencia for the Amic 5 test. This time we can really flow it out here on the motorway. So I'll put to 80 kilometers an hour and accelerate it out to 150. Oh, that's it. So that was the 80 kilometers an hour to 150 kilometers an hour sprint. And here now in this is that the Mercedes B-Class overtaking us at 150 kilometers an hour? Sure is. Well, welcome to Germany, guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so lane change here now at higher speeds. Again, a lot of fun to drive this one. Really cool. It feels definitely way sportier than the looks from the outside promise, actually. What else? As for recuperation, so you can change it here. Left, holding left pedal, it goes to I pedal. So when I hit, or well, when I leave the throttle now, I was so far in level three. Even stronger recuperation. Um, I re usually want to use that I pedal, but always when I restart the vehicle, that one is going away and it starts at level three again. Not sure why they're doing that. Why? Why is it not just that? 
this iPedal function is also being saved when I want to use that in that way. So usually with electric vehicles, I tend to use harsher recuperation, just using the throttle pedal. And that's to me just easier to control. It's the way to drive EVs and why not? And you just learn it to use it gently when you are driving with passengers because you cannot apply so many G-forces on your passengers so that they're driving all the time like Duh, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> So then I'm like <laughs> You know, I, I experienced that myself when I'm being shuttled in electric vehicles and the shuttle drivers are driving the EVs for the first time getting out and I'm really feeling sick big problem with electric vehicles so especially as shuttle drivers or when you drive you know family father or family mother you're driving with your family you have to learn to drive these powerful EVs in a gentle way not to put stress on your passengers maybe some kids will find that funny <laughs> but others will also maybe um, yeah have something against your white seats here in the vehicle and in the back right kids <laughs> yeah so about that um, so maybe let's put it then to the normal driving mode that uh, we don't accelerate it out that harsh anymore and as i show you one more time about that uh, difference between the different different driving modes at the moment here again the eye pedal i can just use the throttle pedal all the time go to acceleration and then living off the throttle immediate deceleration level three here i Reduce it with the red pe uh, right shifting pedal. Yeah, still stronger than level two, level one, level zero. And level zero is then indeed, I let it roll, and it keeps rolling, 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 rolling. Ha! Huh. <laughs> so, um, at times it can be, you know, well, I really have to turn off that lane keeping assist. It's super annoying. So the lane keeping assist, so irritating with this vehicle. I would not use it indeed. Yeah, there's just one vehicle where the assistance systems are even worse, and that's the Tesla Model Y. And yeah, Tesla uh, fans will probably hate me for this, but I can just stress again, the Tesla Autopilot is the worst system on the market, period. And I say that because I've tested every single assistance system from every single manufacturer there is, and Tesla one is the worst by experience, by thousands of thousand kilometers I've driven, it is not really usable at least in europe i've heard it is better in the U better working in the us um, because they can use the system there in a different way or just have more kilometer of experience by their camera systems but here i'm not using a tesla autopilot because it's so bad i rather drive myself it has so many false positives or false negatives you know so recognizing something when there is nothing or the other way around, not reacting when there's something. So, um, yeah, about that. So, assistance systems wise, um, Ford is very good in that one. Audi here in that segment has also done a very good job. Um, also, in the VW and the Skoda, the assistance systems are really good, for example. So, um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. It's not that it's, you know, yeah, but lane keeping assist is really, is really bad with this one. The other systems are actually working quite well. So the main thing about this vehicle here for me is it gives you also while driving this rather unique feeling, driving something special, driving something, something that goes into the future. So excellent driving characteristic, super good in the handling, a lot of fun, very powerful nice from that steering really crisp and direct and of course the excellent charging speed if the battery is already preheated so when you have been and you talked about it earlier when you have been hammering the motorway all the time that's where it usually comes into play that you want to do fast charging then the fast charging is working at these promised high speeds but not when you did not hammer the vehicle. That's the thing here about the recharging. So, yeah, this 800 volt infra, uh, infrastructure then, or architecture, as you say, is then at some point a little bit of a marketing gag, not working in a, um, you know, in, in such a way that it does with the Porsche Taycan or with the Audi e-tron GT. But then again, they are also way more expensive. So, once again, 
a very good EV, no doubt about that. To me, it is not the best EV on the market. As for the Kia EV6, it comes close in very many respects. The technology is kind of the same they're using here in the Hyundai Ioniq 5. Of course, a little bit different from the user interface and also a little better as for the trunk, for example, a little bit more efficient, but most of the stuff we told you today about this vehicle will more or less also count for the Kia EV6. A driving review of the VW ID3 facelift. What have they changed and how good is it now? With Thomas Nautical in 4K full screen, full length, let's go. Front changes is majority this one here because you cannot see this black panel that was there before. Definitely a cleaner, more grown up look now. LED lamps, optional matrix LED and with a nice signature around here and also in the middle part, huge retro VW logo. Turning in case in the front, replace the lower part of the daytime running light. If you have the optional matrix LED and approach the vehicle, for example, in the basement garage, you can see this welcoming signature. Look at that here. The lamps look left and right, kind of greet you and then everything comes to life. And you also have a welcome signature here at the rear with this X and then a build up. Also pretty cool, isn't it? Length at 4 meters 26 or 168 inches stays the same. However, new color. Dark olivine green is now available. Yeah, I tried really hard today, didn't I? Wheels here, the optional 20 inch one, the biggest ones, smaller one you would go for when you want a little bit more dampening comfort. And you can see this additional black play that was there for the pre faced version. It's now gone and also gives you a cleaner side profile and also this, you know, playing around sticker that was here with the honeycomb structure that is also gone. So obviously now a grown up cleaner look. <laughs> Always got my cold with me. No. <laughs> I'm going to tell you all about this one very soon. First of all, acceleration figures, 7.9 seconds for the bigger battery version for the Pro S and 7.3 seconds for the Pro, smaller battery, less weight. Here in the rear, since the facelift, this inner light element is also illuminated. Before it was just basically a decoy element, so that's an upgrade definitely. And what's very interesting about this one, you can fold the number plate and no, it's not a problem when you fold it because the bike carrier that you can install in here also has a number plate. Here, you can put it just in like this and you can also put out this key at the side and then it's actually locked like this. Then you can put the bicycle carrier on that one. It's not meant for a real towing possibility. Battery sizes, 58 kilowatt hours net for the small battery, 77 kilowatt hours net for the big battery. And recharging takes around half an hour from 10 to 80% state of charge. DC charging peaks, 120 for the small battery, 170 for the big battery. And now a concise charging test for you. Yeah, I did change clothes for that. <laughs> so we started at about 10%, yeah, 11% state of charge. And then it directly starts with 120 kilowatt here with the small battery, the 58 kilowatt hour battery. So pretty quick start and also very good temperatures for the battery. We also drove the car before. You always need to have the battery at a good temperature that the quick charge directly works. And like around 50, a little bit over 50% state of charge, the charging current drops. So then we're just at half of the maximum power. And now we reached 80%. So in a little bit less than 34 minutes for today's EV, I think it should be quicker. Khaki, still this trend here, high ghost black everywhere. Also here at the B pillar, this collects a lot of scratches. Just these here are matte, but they also don't look that good. However, what's cool is the door closing sound. That is great quality. Also the panel gaps here and how you know, stable the door feels when you open it. This is here now soft touch, also structure, so better increased build quality here now. Then you have microfiber in this trim, but then again, high gloss black here. Hmm, yeah, they haven't changed that yet, at least. Then you can see the steering wheel with hashtag capacitive BS. They look cool, they're also illuminated, but hard to control while driving. A very small digital instrument cluster behind the steering wheel, but at least we still have one. 
A lot of new cars come without one now. This is the sport seat with integrated head restraint, also with microfiber. There are also other seats available. There's one comfort seat available and the base seat, they have the same base ergonomics and the comfort seat also has microfiber, the base seat fabric. They're all very comfortable indeed. Here the sport seat, they give you a little bit more side support and with 189 or 602, it also leaves enough headroom. So although it's not a, you know, not, not a huge car, it has a lot of space here and great seating comfort indeed. Steering wheel with this facelift here is now also animal free material and they use a lot of recycling also in the whole interior. Interior cockpit overview, if that's relevant for you, there will be already a next refresh coming up in mid 2024. And then this switch key here will be moved here for the stall common like in the ID7 and also here the temperature sliders at the moment they're not backlit then they will be backlit but not for now they couldn't make that ready for the facelift yet hmm. okay the infotainment system actually changes the scheme also according to the driving modes here for example everything red in the sports mode software has been updated yes however still not a huge fan of it sometimes it's just not fast enough it should be a little bit quicker definitely apple carplay and auto integration wireless or wide you can choose that and i would rather count on the next update then so uh, at this moment here yeah i think it's still a little bit too complicated everything but maybe they will improve it over time the quality of the rear view camera should also be better it should be higher resolution by the way if you forget how your car is called there you have the badge to remember front cup holders adaptive next to smartphone holder either than just put in the wireless there's also a wireless charger or then you have the wired chargers to USB-C. what's actually pretty cool also for traveling feeding here these armrests and they can be put in different levels how you desire and if you open them all up you can also see you have a lot of space underneath you can also close this whole stuff rear seats also with nice microfiber and you can see it, you have a middle seat here this is a small battery version so you have the middle seat so five seater in the rear you have a panoramic roof at least you can get one and you can also get this bicycle carrier so three reasons for the small battery version however meanwhile they're also working on the bigger battery version that you can maybe also fit one of the features in that one has to do with maximum weight reasons hmm, yeah then here the rear seat as for the leg room still fits with five tall adults well at least four tall adults because and here is also okay with the headroom exactly in the middle part it is an ev platform no middle tunnel but then it gets a little bit close with the headroom it works yes maybe for shorter ways but overall good usage of space the panoramic roof is fixed however you can close this shade here when it's really really sunny outside are you a fan of a frunk are these frunk fans hmm. <laughs> well here at least there is none so they fitted some parts here underneath and didn't have any space left that's what they say well in this case it is indeed a very short hood trunk area we flip this retro logo 385 liters up to 1275 liters it's a normal area with a little bit less than a meter of 40 inches and the length here is about yeah, a little bit less than 80 centimeters or 31 inches we can fold here two-third one-third split and underneath here you have space for charging cables or in the second step then even space for this bicycle carrier towing hook thing device Hey, welcome to Thomas' driving lounge <laughs> with the VW ID3 facelift. Yeah, these seats are very comfortable, so you almost feel like you can take a nap in them at the same time. And the sports seats and they hold you tighter. Really good support here. And that leads us to sporty driving. Go to the sports mode here. We have the pro version. So the one that is quicker with a smaller battery, less weight. And let's see acceleration from... Let's these cars pass we go from 40 kilometers an hour and let's go 100 
160. There we are. Top speed, so a little bit more. 166 as top speed. Execute order 66. <laughs> yeah, so I think um, the acceleration here, yeah, it's a little bit quicker than in the Pro S version. Top speed, of course, could be a little bit higher. Relatively silent here at higher speeds, not too many wind noises. Lane change, so also good. We have the DCC here, the dynamic chassis control, that's the adaptive suspension, and it gives me good control over the vehicle. Also, the steering input here is a little bit stiffer than. Now we are on the brakes, and what I do criticize is the brake feel. So, in this very low area, you feel like you're not braking at all, and then suddenly you are approaching a vehicle, and oh, I have to brake more. So, you really have to get used to that. Let's hear the philosophy in the D mode. In the B mode, there you lift the throttle and you have strong recuperation, more towards a one pedal driving feeling, but not 100% there. Usually with EVs, meanwhile, I prefer the D mode that it rolls a little bit further. It's also better for the passengers then, because less G force are applied, and then you finally dose it with the brake. Of course, there's this brake blending happening. So, first, there's the recuperation gaining back energy or regenerative braking and then if more braking power is needed then the real brakes are being applied but here I think the sensitivity of the pedal it should be a little bit more sensitive in the very early area here at darkness you can see some emit lighting in the right area echo also changes the color a little bit here and you can see the illumination here also on the steering wheel of these hashtag capacitive buttons that's the only advantage that they're illuminated actually. The sliders, as I said, not illuminated yet, but they will be if you buy this car by around mid 2024. Then you also get illuminated sliders right here. In the comfort mode or the echo mode, the suspension then is a little bit softer if you went for this optional DCC. Still, left and right, it's really, <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah, it's really nice. So you get a good feeling for the vehicle, compact vehicle, very good dimensions. You have perfect control over the vehicle. What I like is going for an individual mode and there, for example, put the suspension to comfort, but the steering with a little bit more resistance and the steering to sport. And that's to me the perfect driving feeling for this vehicle. But still, if you have this vehicle in the, that's what I mean here. So I need more braking power in the first few centimeters than I actually need. The guy just put a, like a chewing gum out of the window or something. Mm, disgusting. Um, yeah, so I think more brake feel in the early area would be needed. But here with the driving modes, all modes are absolutely fine, but you can just pick it. I think this is also one of the strengths of this vehicle, this heli handling, this balance, and also the when you go for the adaptive suspension. Yeah, also just 90 degree corner not too far with the steering wheel. It's just so smooth in the driving. And yes, we know, software problem-wise, yeah, they're still not there. So they have to do better there. And it's coming bit by bit, definitely. But still, it should be better and long time ago. But the hardware of the vehicle, there you feel that they have this long-term experience with their really solid vehicles. So all the hardware concerned, chassis, suspension, driving feeling, handling, steering input, that is really well done. All right, some more sporty driving. Good thing about these huge wheels are that you have more contact to the road. Then again, this advantage is when you have some bumps, then you rather feel it here with the 20-inch wheels. So for sporty driving, it's really cool. And if the roads are even like this, but when you more have bad roads and stuff, then that happens. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> then you also should watch out that you don't get the biggest wheels. Of course, the smaller wheels will always give you more comfort. It's still fine, especially with the DCC, but you just have to pick what's more important to you, the sporty ride or the more comfortable ride, and then you can also choose the wheel size for you. In these narrow corners, very good behavior, look at that. Not too much work on the steering wheel. Center of gravity is really low due to the battery pack. It feels so sporty 
Of course, it's a heavy vehicle, like all electric vehicles, but you don't feel that because of the compact dimensions and the low center of gravity. So it's so much fun to drive. It's really very cool. And it doesn't actually feel too small in the sense of that it's not a grown-up vehicle, you know what I mean? But it's definitely small in the sense of that it feels sporty. So here one more time, a little bit tighter. Also accelerating out, you know this is rear-wheel drive, I love it, I just like rear-wheel drive cars. So when you accelerate out of the corners, it just gets you around the corner a little bit better. And also you can turn in the front wheels very, very much and that ensures also a great turning circle. So this has a very narrow turning circle indeed. When you're, for example, easing the car in and out, the parking lot and so on, or you do a U-turn, you should drive a little bit more to the right. <laughs> that really helps a lot. Uh, I can actually show you that. So you have a little bit more space. And when I just ease the car around here, just basically in a circle, with that here, and this would actually end, but then I can turn the steam wheel in a little bit more. And that's really astonishing. I mean, it's like almost turning on standstill. Look at that. Look at that. I don't even have to back out, back up or something. Wow, that's amazing. You know, that is the advantage of rear-wheel drive only. And here, this electric platform, the front wheels, they can really turn in very wide. Pretty cool. Yeah, so much fun here. Also up the winding corners. What do you think? Our test consumption for today, 16 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometer. That is a little bit less than four miles per kilowatt hour. A real world range then of around 360 km or 220 miles for the small battery. And for a big battery, it would be 480 km or 300 miles. Pretty good figures here indeed. It is summertime, mild temperatures. The car can easily cope with that. But for wintertime, there is also an optional heat pump. You should go for that if you live in a cold climate. Still, the range will be worse. But with these aerodynamic changes, obviously, they could also increase the range with this facelift here a little bit. We've seen a lot of big EVs on the market, but what about the small ones like the Renault Megane E-Tech or the Megane EV? Here on Autogefühl with Thomas, let's go. This here sits on a dedicated EV platform together with the Nissan Aria. However, the Aria are a way bigger vehicle, but they do share the tech. Interesting here that the daytime running light is just in that lower area here. And the turning indicator, you can see here. Top one here, full LED. Here you can also see the daytime running light. I'm just activating here the open and close with the key card. You can see it. also a nice playing of the light signature here in the top part. So they have some interesting ideas. And also with the key card, just when you approach the vehicle, it opens when you leave then it closes and now it gets really interesting because the length is only four meters 20 or 165 inches so really a short ev even the vw id3 is six centimeters or two and a half inches longer than this one here so finally also a small or compact ev well they are still pricey overall but cheaper than the big evs of course and this an area by the way is like this longer so big difference 18 or here 20 inch wheels these are the bigger ones so massive styling this crossover styling also with the crossover wheel arches right here and the very slim window line here raising design line overall pretty strong appearance it doesn't look like as it would be so small and why does it look so strong in the rear once again because that really tiny window that leaves this massive area right here you can see all of the color and so on and also the light signature and so on here these are the turning indicators and there you can see the light signature goes all the way across the vehicle that looks really very cool and one disadvantage of course when you have that small window here yeah it's really hard to see from the inside to the outside but they also thought about an interesting solution in this respect soon going to show you that front wheel drive only this vehicle and the acceleration figures, depending on the version we have, 10 seconds or 7.4. And battery sizes, either 40 or 60 kilowatt hours net. Here today we have the bigger one and that translates in ideal conditions into a range that is something less than 400 kilometers or less than 250 miles. 
also later more about the efficiency or the energy consumption we score here in our test today. And as for recharging, 22 kilowatt AC, that's special, especially for this segment here. And then you like, need like three hours for charging. And then DC 130 kilowatts. So when you have a proper charging station, then you need some 35 minutes, 10 to 80% state of charge. Inside of the doors, top part here is hard pack. Then here we have a nice microfiber insert. Here, this could be a little bit softer when you put your elbows on it, but overall good build quality. Here's some felt being used. And interesting also, the seats are from 100% recycled material. That is great. Here you have the bright fabric, Scandinavian furniture design style, or there's also a black styling available. Here with some leather on the outside, so all animal free. Only the highest trims, they come with animal skin. Steering wheel is animal skin wrap in the higher trims, only animal free in the lowest trim actually. And interesting that button wise, it's very well to control. You have some capacitive buttons, but it's a mix, you know, some capacitive, some real. So overall the user interface on this vehicle is quite good. Seating position, well, it's a small vehicle, but rather feels compact vehicle here in the front. Headroom, one wheel is 89 or six for two. Still a lot of headroom left, no problem at all. And the seats are also very comfortable, nice and soft, but also, you know, durable enough. At least that's how they feel at this moment. So it's actually a very nice cockpit. Also this whole layout here and steering wheel goes up and down manually. Um, yeah, um, it's maybe not the nicest process, but it does the job. And this is the cockpit overview. Really clean, nice layout. When I look for the steering wheel, digital instruments, and on the right side, either 9 inch or here the optional 12 inch infotainment. What's really cool here is that bright fabric on the dashboard that creates a very nice atmosphere in the interior. Digital instruments look like these, and when you pick the driving modes, it adapts actually, it shows in a different color also counts for the ambient lighting for example and you can also switch that whole view so um, you have different total views like this is like an you know like a map view you can see here it does not flicker in real life by the way it's just hard to pick it up on camera that doesn't flicker on both screens at the same time or you have this one in here or this i would say emulated analog style with the round gauges here also have recuperation pedals to change the recuperation modes. More to that while driving. We need to talk about the stock columns as well. Here, this is in the shifting lever, drive, reverse, park. And then you have a second stock here for the wipers and it's really close to each other and you can mistake one for another while driving. And then there's even a third one and that one is even underneath. And the good thing is you can also control the volume then just when reaching behind the steering wheel and also next title by you know turning that disc here in the, in the part here behind. Renault users know this device, it's kind of old school, it's good to have it, but then again three star cones on one side. Hmm. This infotainment system is really interesting because it is Android Automotive. So there's a difference. Android Auto is like Apple CarPlay, the direct smartphone mirroring. Android Automotive is the whole system that Volvo is offering Polestar and now also Renault. It means it's Android based and you have it in a very simple way. Everything is straightforward and you have native Google Maps embed. And that is of course an awesome thing to have. Really responsive. That's how it's done. Audi, BMW, Mercedes, VW spend billions on their own infotainment systems and they fail this one is faster, it's better, has Google Maps, everyone wants that for uh, navigation. Well, and at the same time, you can have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay here. I mean, this is perfect, so why not more manufacturers go this way? They will have to, I guess. The Apple CarPlay integration is also really cool, very large, and you can easily pick your songs and so on, and also can use <laughs> Google Maps inside there, but in this case you can save all your data from your smartphone and then use the, the car for the direct um, uh, Google Maps here. So I'm really happy with that system. And we have Harman Kardon sound system in here. And I have to say, great surround sound, especially for this vehicle segment here. Thumb up below the screen, that's really interesting. Here, still real knobs for climate unit vent strength and so on so that's a good user interface that we still have that 
and below that this is an inductive charging pad. Lower middle console has a lot of space and here you set these individual you can set them a little bit uh, wider for example that you can have you know like big bolts or small bolts and this is here another cup holder. Then you have this armrest can you put it up this leatherette cover and then more space underneath. As for the rear doors here yeah, the hands are there so it's a nice integration why not? Also the nice bright fabric design with the leather red mix for the rear seats. So the styling here overall really cool, very modern and cozy. However here, yeah, for four to adults, nothing really special. So I do hit my knees here. It's a short vehicle, so it's no wonder actually. If you would put the seat a little bit higher, then I could fit a little bit better in this recess here. Headroom wise here, however, it's actually quite okay. I do fit in here. So considering that this car is so short, the offering of space here on the rear is actually quite decent. And even if you sit here in the middle, yeah, it gets close as for the knees, but when the drivers are a little bit shorter, maybe put the seat forward, then you can for short periods even use that one with five adults, not the tallest ones, but at least it works somehow. Two USB-C chargers, by the way, here in the middle console. This, by the way, here the extras list. And there you can see the higher trim with a big battery, already close to 50,000 euros. And then we have some extra equipment. We always land at, yeah, a little bit less than 50,000 euros then. You open the trunk here with this button, and it's a manual hatch. And it's around 400 liters and it's quite spacious. You can see here, you can put a cabin trolley even upright in that one. However, then there's a very, you know, high loading sill but overall you can see these 400 liters of capacity very well usable although there's this you know high loading sill but then you gain a lot of height well i don't understand here when you close it it always crushes down you hear that who designed this and why i mean did no one actually see that in production or well, i'd say before production Width some 90 centimeters or 35 inches. Height is almost 80 centimeters or 30 inches, so that's actually quite cool. And also the length about 80 centimeters, 30 inches. Your cables you can store here underneath actually, even more space. And we fold the seats from the rear area and then you get 145 in centimeters or 57 inches. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the Renault Megane E-Tech or Renault Megane EV. That's how I call it to keep it simple. We have here different driving modes. We'll pull to sport mode. Ooh, also flashing everything in red and the instruments. German Autobahn, freeway, the motorway here, famous German motorway from 40 kilometers an hour. Let's accelerate to top speed. Let's go. Plop, top speed, 160 kilometers an hour, 100 miles per hour. Ah, it goes even 166 kilometers an hour. You know, the tachometer usually shows a little bit more speed than it really is on GPS. But that went quick, definitely from the get-go. Then it slowed down bit by bit. The acceleration figure, 0 to 1 kilometers an hour, 62 miles an hour, 7.4 seconds. Here it feels very good to handle, actually, on the motorway at high speeds. Not too loud, because this is not a typical speed then here, the top speed. But here, lane changing here, very nicely done. Good feeling from the steering wheel as well. The suspension is doing a good job, although we have the big wheels here. It's not too uncomfortable, but really keeping the car upright low center of gravity because of the battery pack and here at a motorway speed of 100 kilometers an hour 60 miles an hour also reasonable as for the noise installation so yeah i mean we know these days where some of the french vehicles besides maybe like a megan rs or something but most of the base setup of french vehicles were rather like on a soft note but here with the electric vehicles with a low center of gravity and you know, a little bit of a sport here approach also, also that the car doesn't shake up. So it feels pretty agile and sporty indeed. That is, uh, that is very interesting, interesting surprise. Here you know, in the tunnel you can see more of these driving modes and also then here when I go to the normal comfort mode for example, it switches back to this more bluish surrounding. And we can also see that here in the ambient lighting that is really nicely done and that ambient lighting once again 
switches here for example on eco mode mode in yellow sport and then in red so very nice ambient lighting here and also according to the driving mode that's pretty cool the driving modes don't make the biggest difference usually probably you would keep it in normal comfort mode let's take steering wow this is like hmm, very sudden reaction from the steering sport mode a little bit faster but then you know when you're at higher speeds and have it gentle but it, whoa that's interesting so when you turn the steering wheel a little bit more so i'm usually very smooth with steerings you know so like this and you have to do that when you're in this vehicle because when you apply a little bit too much of that steering you feel like putting that car all over the place so hmm and why is this one not really driving let's see that's a nice thing you do with that ev changing that mx5 it was slowing down for whatever reason well this is really cool nice handling but yeah when you push that steering too far it reacts a little bit too harsh too arcade ally too much in a computer game simulation or something that's by the way also the thing with the back mirror so when i put it to the camera system i have actually a better view through that digital back mirror because the normal back mirror i can't see stuff here when i look out but it's like very slim window but the, th the thing is here by the mirrors top right left i always have a three-dimensional image of my surrounding and when i look at a screen this just fakes three dimensions it's not really three dimensions it's a 2d screen and that's why i can't really estimate the distances you know so i see more in a way but i see less in the sense of i have a feeling what's going on behind me and where is that vehicle so when i see it on the screen i know there is something but i have no idea where it actually is and that's why i'm always a fan of the normal solutions one thing of course we yeah in this case when it's really slim in the rear uh, window or when you put the luggage all the way up to the you know very top that everything is blocked in the view then it would make sense assistance systems here let's also go back to the normal comfort mode and then we can activate for example the cruise control adaptive cruise control here left side of the steering wheel um, these buttons here are you know it's, it's, a, it's a mix of capacitive and rear buttons it's okay they also give some kind of feedback and here you set then the cruise control speed and that's well done i'm fine with that definitely so and yeah so far it's working quite well there is a blind spot monitor let me show you that so now when the car is coming here should be appearing right now there we go so it's in the second the car is in that blind spot not in advance that's the philosophy also of the french manufacturers at psa so peugeot citroen i don't share this opinion i rather want a warning in advance and not too late actually so but you can argue for that now like 120 to 160 let's go 30 40 150 that's enough for now you see there is still something coming as for the, the acceleration so even though it's not the strongest ev and you have front wheel drive only you have sufficient power on the motorway just not that super high top speed which is definitely a german thing so here when the car goes 160 max yeah you're in a very very low spectrum and as for comparable cars or also the comparable petrol cars and so on but also noise insulation wise is also not meant to be driven that you know, that, that fast actually as for the fuel economy of course it gets boosted fuel economy energy economy of course it gets boosted when you drive so fast or oh, a nice rs5 it's first generation rs5 actually that's pretty cool 
about uh, silver design. So and now we're getting off the motorway right here. Yeah, it feels really agile, a lot of fun. We also do some agile winding corners very soon. See about the concert driving fun in these serpentine corners or roads. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the only thing is just when you go like slalom really quickly, then the reaction of the steering is too harsh. Other than that, it's very good driving. I mean, it's a lot of fun. It feels very compact. It is compact and suspension is not too bad because remember there's multi-link rear rear axle or rear suspension. That's also very rare for a vehicle in this size here, in this not even shortness, but maybe like yeah, <laughs> this length, this shortness. So overall, I mean this is a sporty step from suspension, especially with the big wheels. But you know, we have seen that the exterior is likable. We've seen that the interior delivers here a cool lounge atmosphere. is also still comfortable in driving, also for tall passengers. Something I do notice while driving is that some of the surfaces that look cool, but are maybe a little bit too hard. Yeah, I know some like it hard, but not maybe in any case. <laughs> so here um, in the middle console, my knee is, you know, Touching that really hard thing, it's just like a very, very thin soft leather red cover. The same also for the, my left elbow, it's not too soft, and also here the middle console, it's not too soft. I like to drive relaxed here with the elbows resting left and right, and it is somewhat okay, but it's not really soft and not super comfortable. So, a little bit softer dampening here, here, and here, that would have been cool actually. I would would definitely appreciate that. Other than that, what else we can talk about? Recuperation, it's an electric vehicle. And when you start up the vehicle, there's a standard recuperation set. And manufacturers do that because the homologation has to be in this specific one mode. And then you can all do the driving cycles and the consumption test and so on and so on. Therefore, one has to be standard. And this is the one with some slight recuperation. I lift my foot off the throttle or the accelerator pedal, pedal here in the electric vehicle and there's some ex, uh, some um, deceleration, some regenerative braking and then I can also diminish that completely. I can let the car roll by putting that pedal here on the right side. So just rolling, 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 rolling. Ha. And then I can also use the left pedal, go to back go back to the mode, one more, so more regenerative braking and then even more. That is then the strongest possible with three you know, dots inside there or three small arrows. And here you can see I stop before I want to stop actually here. I have to apply some throttle once again and now, but the car is not coming to a complete halt. So it's, I would say it's not the 100% one pedal driving feeling here. But here with a strong recuperation, you hardly have to use the brake pedal sometimes. And here when you want to come to a final stop. Um, of course, the regenerative braking is always working, no matter in which mode you are in there. That is, oh, that is, you've seen that guys, that BMW, that was not okay, that tuning, right? That looked a little bit weird, didn't it? So back there to the EV here. Um, with the regenerative braking, of course, always when you use the brake pedal, it is active. So if you do it by lifting the throttle and putting the motor stronger, or if you're pressing the brake pedal yourself and have rather the rolling mode activated, it has no effect on the, oh, there's a Honda E, has no effect on the concise regenerative braking you do gain, and you, you do actually. It's just a different method, actually. And which one I prefer? Mm, rather when it's not that strong, but when it's adaptive, you know, when it's, for example, working together, if that's the car in front of you or not, that's to me, I think, the favorable solution that you sometimes have to have it the region, sometimes not. Then again, people can say, mm, yeah, it's not predict predictable. It's also a very good aspect. I thought about this and so maybe the adaptive recuperation is only solution when it's very, very well done. Or you say, you know, here like Renault does, hey, we put some recuperation and that's it. 
you know, and people should get used to that actually. And then if you want more, press the brake pedal. Yeah, there's always a big discussion about what's actually best. And now, agile corners. Let's put in that sport mode. Let's see, front wheel drive only. If we have some understeering. Here in the sport mode, definitely the throttle input is way more spontaneous. Here at Rough Road, we also feel more of these big wheels then, so if you want more comfort, stick with smaller wheels. Yeah, here yeah, road is slightly wet, and we have all that EV power. Then you maybe also heard that we had some wheel spin there in the front. Not too bad though. Let's see here. Direct steering. Yeah, you have to be very cautious. So a little bit wet road and sport mode doesn't really work that well. Then you do have under steering, so you have to be very gentle with the throttle or stick with the comfort mode. Then the vehicle is definitely better to control. So there's a lot more moist building up in the outside, but it's really wet actually, outside and hot at the same time. So maybe that might be just the weather conditions. It's a lot of fun actually to steer it here in these corners. So actually great handling. So because it's so short, it has a low center of gravity. And you don't feel that weight of the batteries, you know, that the EVs are always heavier because of that battery weight. But here, since it's short, and you have the low center of gravity, it's really a lot of fun to drive. Really very, very cool. Just that I do prefer the rear steering for the EVs, especially because they have so much power. It just makes more sense, in my opinion. Yes, then again, you can say, mm, you can have better recuperation when you have the front electric motor. Then also depends if they offer an all-wheel drive, that you have two electric motors. So there are always pro and cons to the drive systems, but hey, I'm always arguing for the driving fun. And then of course, rear-wheel drive is more fun actually. Now going downhill, being in the big recuperation mode, then I just have to put my foot off the throttle and there you can see even though it's very steep now, the car is still decelerating. And then we can also get back some of the energy. And the consumption, you know, when I had some acceleration tests in here now, so that one brought it a little bit more up, but I did some earlier driving tests and it's still close to that figure. So my average figure here for different use cases and so on is something 16 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. So that's like 26 kilowatt hours on 100 miles. That would translate into a third 375 kilometer or like 240 miles range. So this is quite good conditions when it's warm. At here now, AC has also been running. So we're driving slowly here because of doggies. It's also a good thing to have the EVs. We don't annoy the doggies here, which can, you know, they can they can hear, of course, really, really, really well. So here we go. So um, back to the range. Quite good conditions for the EVs. Not too cold. Of course, it might be different in wintertime or if you speed it up constantly on the motorway. But considering the size of the vehicle, and I mean, it has a decent battery size, definitely, when you pick the bigger one. I think that range is definitely good and also the efficiency is actually just fine. We had some better efficiency within this and area, but that were, you know, even better conditions in that case. And also then of course the bigger battery um, is also available for the area so you can, you know, maximize it up as for the range. But overall I think very good here also in the driving test. Is it one of the best small EVs? I think we can very well say so. We have seen so many expensive electric vehicles, but what about affordable ones? This could be one, the MG4 EV. This is a compact electric vehicle between 32 and 38,000 euros. So as it stands here right now in a top trim, less than 40,000 euros, finally an affordable electric vehicle. But how capable is it? How good is it? Is it actually even better than the competition? Although it's some point, yeah, like five, six, seven thousand euros cheaper than comparable competition models. We'll find out more here with Thomas on Autogefühl for you. Let's go. Big microphone time today against the background noises for the best sound experience for you guys. Here, look at that MG logo. Don't we know that? Yes, we know that it's a former British brand. The Chinese have bought it. Who's behind it? It's Saik, 
and they also have this joint venture, Saic Volkswagen in China. This is one of two VW joint ventures, the other one is FAW Volkswagen and that means that this company really knows how to build volume models. They have so many built cars already and a lot of experience. They are together with VW one of the market leaders in China indeed and now they are coming with their own brand or purchased brand to Europe trying to conquer the European market. This is one of their models they want to do that with the compact MG4 EV. You can see here the date running light, really modern structure here. Bright and blue is this maybe like baby Thomas blue color for today. But we also have this fizzy orange, also very interesting. They have screaming out colors, but you can also get this vehicle in more subtle colors. The whole design, you can see everything runs to the front, has, you know, really aerodynamic appearance. A little bit of Nissan Leaf maybe. And beside the Leaf, the Renault Megane EV, for example, or the VW ID3 would be the competitors, actually. 4 meters 29 or 169 inches is the length. It's a compact hatch, and I think design-wise here in the side profile, it's actually really clean and interesting. Here you can see, because they have the blacked-out area here, you have to be in like a appearing a flying roof, so to speak, here in this top trim, 17-inch wheels, otherwise a little bit smaller. And quality-wise on the exterior, panel gaps seem to be quite equal here in the top part and so on. Contrasting mirror caps, but yeah, here in the lower part, you know, this plastic part, this seems a little bit odd here that you have this big gap right here. Hmm. Oh, what's your take on that? And they will have the rear-wheel drive version so far, so you have like a agile driving feeling I think for electric vehicles why not that will give you more driving fun acceleration figure will be around or a little bit less than eight seconds later on they also promise an all-way drive version with a separate electric motor in the front end as well this will have done less than four seconds in the acceleration battery sizes 51 64 kilowatt hours so far later on they also want to deliver a 77 kilowatt hour battery we're driving a 64 kilowatt hour battery today. The entry level price would be for the small battery, but still with the bigger battery, the 64 kilowatt hours, you can stay less than 40,000 euros. And that's of course really interesting. The realistic electric range will tell you more about that later when we drive the car and see about the consumption. Video is two dimensional, but that you can see the three dimensional shape of these tail lamps. Look at that. I put these screws in there. You can really, really use it as a picnic area. I mean, look at that shape here. Um, I can maybe use the banana as a turning indicator, right? Um, <laughs> so here, uh, look at that also here. I mean, three-dimensional shape, aerodynamic. Of course, the air flows here and here. That looks really amazing indeed. And look at that contrast with the blue and the yellow banana color. Yeah, sorry about that. So, <laughs> so and you see the, the lamp design here. Look at that horizontal here. I mean, this is screaming out design in the rear, but I like it when they do something unique. In the lower area, then also contrasting black and gray. Why not? Top speed, by the way, will be 160 kilometers an hour or 100 miles an hour. And here the MG4 electric batch right here. This is green batch. Overall, I think the design here, quite impressive, isn't it? And turning indicator check. Yeah, very interesting here with the vertical shape in the lower and in the front. And in the rear also quite unique. So they found some unique ways to style also the turning indicators. Why not? That could be also some kind of like battery status indicator, you know, um, looks like that, doesn't it? And now we do a fast charging test from 8% state of charge. By the way, the German language version is really interesting. Bitte lade Pistole einstecken. That's wrong. It's like charging gun or charging pistol, which is... Not correct in the translation, but fun anyway. Um, so let's see how fast we can get from 8 or let we count them from 10% to 80% state of charge. Let's go. So let's see. Now we're at 10% and already at 138 kilowatts. So a little bit higher than the official figure. So far a good charging curve. So even at 30% state of charge, still at almost 140 kilowatt, still charging quite quickly. Now about 60% state of charge. This is, you know, like between 50 and 60, where the power has dropped a little bit, but still at 100 kilowatt. And if we take a look at the charging curve, we can see that was really steady all the time. You can see here between 50 and 60%, now it's beginning to drop. 
And now any second we'll be at 80% state of charge and yeah, 8 or 10 to 80% now we can see in about, there we are, 80% in 25 minutes. So that's better than the official figure indeed. And we charge 46 kilowatt hours in that time. And let's take a look at the charging curve. You can see really flat here it dropped, but overall this is the average charging speed. So a incredible result once again, considering the price of the vehicle. This is the car key, rather plain, basic. Question is the door closing sound, famous test in auto crew. It's actually very solid, so this is like golf alike, <laughs> I would say. And then here at the interior, inside of the doors, this is hard pack, so this is one part where they did some cost saving then to achieve that really cheap price. Window levers here are actually quite okay. Um, there's no dual insulation in the glass whatsoever, but we can expect it for that price. Then here a soft touch leatherette, enough space in the door pockets. And then that interior looks actually quite clean. So let's start with the seats here. This is fabric on the inside, leatherette on the outside. They say that for the seats they use all animal free material. You have real buttons at the steering wheel. So not all hashtag capacitive BS. So they have kind of a mix. They still have a lot of buttons, steering wheel also on the um, center console. We'll show that to you very soon. Seating position is actually quite standard compact hatch. It's not super comfortable, but it's not uncomfortable. So everything in this respect is more like average, but that's fine, again, considering the price. Also, like the materials and, you know, the seat, um, I'm not sure how durable it will be, but so far, first side, it's okay. Steering wheel um, adjustment, like here, the adjustment itself, like how you feel, there's no resistance. So um, everything feels from the build quality, let's say, all right, you don't buy a premium vehicle here. You have to remember, and considering the price, that's actually fine. So it's, it's quite astonishing what they can deliver for that price. Headroom here in the front with 189 or six for two, no problem. So for tall elves in the front, this is indeed comparable with an impression you get maybe like in the Renault Megane E-Tech. Interior overview, really clean design, seven inch on the left, 10.25 inch screen on the right. Soft touch is this area right here. And zoom on to the screens. Really interesting is that here the gear selector, they have it with this, you know, turning, reverse, drive. So this is an easy solution, inductive charging pad right here. The rear view camera, however, when you put it in reverse, this is kind of weird, you know, like like really weird format. You can cannot really see that. It's too narrow, that angle there, definitely. Um, yeah, but other than that, back again to the park mode. And then you have this kind of like this flying console and underneath you have the connection in USB-A or USB-C for your smartphone, um, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto is standard actually, but wired. But it's good that they have it in standard. Cup holders and a lot of space here. You can also close this area if you like. And then you have this middle armrest with a very leathered surface. You are quite well attached. Everything more like basic materials, but one, once again, keep in mind the price. They have an interesting solution here for the control at the steering wheel. For example, this is here, the volume adjustment then from the steering wheel, so for the music. But when you press the hotkey button, you can program that yourself, then it changes and it is the climate control. And then on the right side, you can see here, how with up and down pressing on the steering wheel, I can change the temperature and with left and right, I can change the vent strength. And by that way, I don't have buttons here, which I would miss, but since I can control it on the steering wheel, it's actually an interesting solution. Why not? Volume button are still here at the infotainment system. So this is another solution than, for example, for the passenger seat. They have also a nice clicking sound. This is a home hotkey. The infotainment software is very slow. That's the downside. However, the overview is quite okay. As you can see here, it's not that responsive, takes some time. Um, yeah, most of the time you will probably use Apple CarPlay or Android Auto anyways. This is always here a hotkey then for the climate unit to put it on or off. It's also actually an easy solution. And then it's also interesting that we can change the driving modes. For example, the throttle input is changing in sport mode or so. You can also um, change it at the steering wheel, for example. And here you can change the 
recuperation modes if you more want a like one pedal driving feeling or if you want for example this adaptive that it's sometimes when the car is in front of you goes regenerative braking when there's freeway it does not do it mg pilot this is how they call their assistance systems they have everything on board actually you can also deactivate it then in here and also how you know strong they should work interesting also as for the preconditioning of the battery it's not bound actually that you have it in the gps when you have a charging station you can indeed activate it right here when you know you're going to fast charge very soon then you just activate it here and then your battery is preconditioned depending of course not in one minute but maybe like in 10 15 minutes yeah and we were missing the carplay or android auto integration looks like this and the interesting thing here is that the sound system here in that luxury trim level is actually really good a great sound indeed at least here in this high trim instruments are kept simple speed you can see here i can also adjust the distance for the cars at the steering wheel here for the adaptive cruise control and on the right side you can also choose if you want to have some um, consumption figures here for example or if you want some basic GPS information and so on or here also change the brightness level of the screen for example what I also like is here left next to the steering wheel and no BS approach to change the side mirrors left and right so yeah I don't want to control the mirrors in the infotainment system this is just a easy straightforward solution you know I applaud them for that rear seating area by the way the door closing sound of the rear doors is actually quite solid here instead of the doors also hard pack this is then soft touch leatherette here and you also have the real you know switches here actually is it quite okay i mean you again feel it is a budget vehicle but it's not too bad actually so considering the price I would say it's really fine so let's get inside and this is the seat as I would be driving so that gets close as for the legroom so for four really tall adults um, maybe not the ideal thing but for shorter trips you can live with that um, the comfort itself I mean the seats are actually quite soft actually they don't give you much support and you kind of sink in a little bit I'm showing that here with that seating area um, yeah that maybe could be a little bit more supportive you also have isofix here for the rear seats and another thing where you realize this is more a budget vehicle is like the mechanism here for folding the seats um, it's only possible here and yeah this I mean these are early production vehicles and they said that more things will be improved let's see if this one will be one of the parts but yeah again this has a very very attractive price considering also the competition and i think quality wise it's not so much worse than the competition but here and there you feel yeah okay that's where they saved some money but again when you pay really like substantial couple of thousand euros less than i think is something you can live with and then headroom that's actually fine for toilet adults and you can see here uh, when for example the passenger seat here in the front is not moved all the way back like when I'm driving yeah sorry for that then well with three toilet adults it's actually fine to drive and does it have a frunk -da -da. no it does not have a frunk whatsoever however what it does feature is a heat pump at least in the higher trim level so you have to pay for that basically more interesting elements here on top of the rear lamps by the way you can for example see them when opening the trunk and it has 350 liters of capacity let's see how usable it is you can see here this cabin trolley fits in a vertical way that's actually quite cool the width here when you take the inner area so not with you know like without these the inner area is less than a meter or 40 inches actually and the length here stand length is 75 centimeters or 29 inches however what's really interesting when we take out the luggage right here first of all you can fold the bench of course in a two-third one-third split then it's there where you know much longer and you can see here you can lift that one up and this is a nice solution for two charging cables quite clean solution 
yeah, if you use these box and always take them out and put them in again, that's of course a different question. But overall, considering the size of the vehicle, it's well usable. All right, let's start this right here, Thomas's driving lounge with the MG4 EV. And we'll start here in the city because this will be the primary use of this vehicle. Some city traffic, how good is it actually here? 17 inch wheels, standard suspension is mounted. However, we have Multilink in the rear, so that's actually good for the whole comfort. And here at the traffic light, yeah, some nice acceleration here. So that rear wheel drive is giving us a good boost. And of course, the electric vehicles, they always have instant torque. And that's why you always have very good acceleration, especially from the traffic light. Steering here is really precise. Also, when you do some slight movements with the steering, the car is actually reacting. Let's see here a lane change. And it still feels actually quite natural. So at the moment, I don't have set it haven't set it to the strongest recuperation. We can um, have this hotkey here. Or we can also change the driving modes, for example. This is then um, how the throttle is actually reacting. And then we can also take a look at the recuperation modes driving. So um, there is strong adaptive now in, in the sports mode. So it also changes then together with the driving mode. So when I'm in sport mode, for example, it also switches them to strong. Let's see when I'm accelerating. Turning indicator sounds a little bit like in an echo area or something, right? So yeah, maybe they could, they could fine tune that. So when it, this traffic light jumps to green, I have some acceleration out of the corner actually. And let's see how that one goes. Interesting also this, there we go. Oh, that's pretty quick. Yeah, and indeed also a lot of fun once again with the rear-wheel drive. So I think it's a good decision to go for rear-wheel drive with these electric vehicles here. Sport mode indeed. I will change something from the steering, normal mode. Not really, but the throttle input is a little bit different. Here, when I'm going off the throttle, it's not the super strong deceleration indeed. Let's change that. Let's go weak. Yeah, this is more than rolling, medium, slight recuperation, strong. This is strong, I am. Yeah, so when you're more trying to go towards a one pedal driving feeling, then adaptive. Let's see how that one works out. Let's try on the right side still. So here. Now one in front of me, not that strong acceleration. Now I'm getting closer. Uh, hmm. That didn't work too well, actually. So uh, when I have other vehicles with adaptive recuperation, it's that they have stronger recuperation when there's a car then in front of you. So um, yeah, that wasn't that convincing, actually. So when I'm switching back to the Apple CarPlay, let's see how that works out. So it always depends on how good the car is to be controlled while driving. Let's see here, Google Maps, let's get here. Yeah, but I think it's from, from the user interface. I really like the vehicle because they still have some straightforward solutions and not only hashtag capacitive BS all over the place. The driving comfort here. So um, as a tall driver, um, I feel that the seating comfort is not bad, but it could be a little bit better. So I wouldn't say it, it works for tall adults here in the front. Yes, but it's not that I would say yeah, I maybe want to spend hours and hours and hours here on, on that front seat. So there are a little bit mixed feelings about that. It's of course really silent in here. That is a good thing also in city traffic. And you know you don't produce any local emissions here, of course, with the electric vehicle. And also if we compare it now to the competitors, which aren't really like premium vehicles or something. I mean, driving it also, it drives very well. So. Uh, this is indeed a very, very good price performance offer. And I can already say right now, maybe one of the best price performance offer on the, on the market. It's really fun to drive. It feels light, it's agile from the steering, I have precise control. Suspension, it doesn't lean too much to the sides or something. So it's actually fine. I think it's my right of way. 
and also just cruising around in town here is actually a lot of fun. So um, if we then compare the VW ID3, Renault Megane E-Tech, for example, and Nissan Leaf, they are all very well to drive. The ID3 would also have the rear wheel drive. So um, driving agility wise, that would be the closest competitor, I would say. And indeed you feel it brings you just more joy to the whole thing. We will also drive a longer period of time for you here today. And later on then we can tell you even more about the, like the real, real world um, consumption. And then of course the concise EV range. And yeah, that's a lot of beeping here. Um, I don't know what that was supposed to be, but probably like lane change warning or something. So some beeping sounds here and there, but it's not too intrusive. Overall, this vehicle is not too intrusive. Um, you don't feel that you wouldn't be responsible anymore or something. You know, some of the new or modern cars, they just have too much of everything. But here, I think they found actually a good compromise that they have some modern assistance systems and so on, but they don't exaggerate it actually. And now let's take it to the German Autobahn, to the motorway, to see how does it perform when you drive a little bit faster. Now in the German Autobahn, motorway here, and we are at like 110 kilometers an hour. And let's accelerate it out in sports mode. Let's go. Okay, it's not much happening, but it's coming, coming, coming. 150. Let's see top speed. Should be around now goes further 171 in kilometers an hour so yeah it's like 105 miles per hour so a little bit faster than expected now we have to go down again and yeah wind noise of course picking up however i have to say it is quite windy today outside you've maybe already seen in our static review um so yeah we hear notable wind noises but again windy outside so I would say from the noise installation, it's actually not too bad. And how the suspension handles here on the motorway is actually quite calm and collected. The steering is indeed really reactive. So some small steering commands lead to a you know, really notable effect already indeed. You have to bear that in mind, but you can very well control it. What I do feel from time to time that it's a little bit narrow here for my right knee actually with that middle console. So when you have long legs, um, not that ideal, but it's okay when you hold them rather straight. But overall, it feels also very well calm and collected on the motorway. So this kind of sets like, you know, like an affordable average standard to me. So yeah, it's not that it would be my favorite EV ever or something. But once again, considering the price, I think the driving part really confirms it that this is at this moment so far the best price performance ev so yeah you have to live here and there with some things that yeah it could be better when it's like a more premium car or whatever but then you pay like maybe at least five six seven thousand euros more but even then is it really better okay maybe if you pay double the price then but do you want to pay double the price then to have some things better so once again phew, yeah, this is really astonishing that they can put this one here together for such a price. It drives very, very well. Here also, look at that, some slalom here when we are at 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. It's actually very, very good. One more acceleration from zero to 120 kilometers an hour. Let's go, sports mode. Plop 100 and 120. Yeah, so you see from zero, it's actually quite cool. And that's also the crucial thing then for lower speed or city driving and so on. Yeah, why not? And again, it feels really nice and sporty, lane changing here. It's a lot of fun. So all the hardware components feel very well made together. Some look at the assistance systems. We have the blind spot monitor. There we go. No additional acoustic warning though when I use the indicator then. And it appears 
rather late, so when the car is exactly in the blind spot, but not before. Maybe like an earlier recognition would be better. And here, the cruise control, adaptive cruise control, I set here at the steering wheel then, up and down with the speed. And the distance to the car in front of me, also pretty solid. Just the lane keeping assist. I'm gonna activate that one. Um, let's see. That intervenes, actually. It's like the emergency lane keeping assist. Uh, sometimes I felt that the lane keeping assist was a little bit annoying um, and it didn't react too fast. At the same time, it does react in some situations where it maybe should not react. So yeah, not a fan of the lane keeping assist, but in that case, then I would deactivate that. The rest of the assistance systems also work very well. And now look at our consumption for today. 15.6 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That's really efficient. That is around four miles per kilowatt hour in that unit. And what does it mean for the real world range? Really excellent figures. 410 kilometers of range here or 260 miles. That's excellent for this 64 kilowatt hour net battery. And if you then would imagine you would put the later coming 77 kilowatt hour battery in this one here with the same, same consumption, or let's say almost equal. Maybe when you have the overdrive version a little bit less, but with that bigger battery at that kind of efficiency, it would be even then 500 kilometers or 300 miles of range. So it also ticks the efficiency box. And then we can just really say at that price for that range, hardly without any competition. So what could we find out in our today's episode? First of all, the Volvo EX30, really small, the tiniest one here in this comparison. Then the internal brother, a little bit bigger and recently also with the facelift version, more efficient. So at this point, I would actually then go for the XC40 to just have more efficiency and a better range overall. I think the Volvo XC40 is a very good offering in this segment. It is not the most new, fancy and so on, but it still offers a good quality on the interior and also nice driving experience. The Zeker X has the best premium interior actually. However, as for assistance systems and the overall software and so on, it has one of the worst status at this moment. Of course, they can fix it at a later stage and still, at this premium interior quality, the price performance is also good. Same accounts for the Smart Hashtag 3. Yes, they really call it Hashtag 3, but we can also just say Smart 3. That's to me absolutely fine. Also, it's a very high class interior, but here some do not like the exterior. And I also have to say that it doesn't look that stylish. Or what do you think? The Tesla Model 3 is of course always as for price performance top of the game. They have their supercharging network. It is quick in the recharging. And now recently with the facelift, with the update of the Tesla Model 3, it got even better. So just some extra pricing for that facelift, but then you get so much better interior with these all new seats and even good comfort. The only thing that is to me a problem when I'm quite tall, the Tesla Model 3, actually you sit really high with your head inside the ceiling almost on the front seats so this can be a problem to tall drivers will not be a problem if you are not as tall as me so that depends but you really have to say it is still somewhat of a benchmark both towards the smaller and also towards the little bit larger models because of that excellent price performance ratio recently also got competition now also in Europe with the BYD Seal, of course, as well. Then the Kia Niro EV is a very likable EV indeed. It doesn't have the best range and efficiency though, but it has a good package as for the length. So you have so much space on the interior, although the car is not long at all. The Kia EV6 then features the fast charging possibility. That is the difference. I mean, yes, the Kia Niro EV and the brother, the Kona EV, also offer fast charging, but the Kia EV6 has this 800 volt architecture together with the 
Ionic 5 and they are so quick in recharging here. Of course, both the lead and the test. They are again a little bit more expensive and a little bit longer. Would be more Model 3 competitors definitely. But as I said, people often compare, think about how ah, do I go for the Nero V or for the EV6 and so on. Then, of course, you have to consider the price difference between these. The ID3 has also been facelifted. It's really nice as for the interior now. So they have upgraded that. Also have one of the best seats, actually, and a lot of space also in the front seat, especially. But overall, they cannot stand out with their EV facts and also with the price neither. And then there's the Renault Megane. And the Renault Megane is actually also very good, especially with the Android automotive infotainment system where you have a native google support google maps support so you don't need to use it on your smartphone so that works also very well the same by the way also accounts for the volvo models yeah and then the mg4 which is basically an id3 built by the chinese and then they made the ev facts better better efficiency better range and also way better fast charging and so on so this is kind of tricky for vw and then when you think about that they offer that one at a very decent price whew, yes the interior build quality is worse than with the id3 you have to point that out but actually the mg4 is the first chinese manufacturer vehicle ev that is sold in very notable numbers in the eu and that of course speaks for itself so overall which one would i pick well if price performance is the most important to you the mg4 will be the cheapest vehicle in this test without being the worst one also so if it's just about price then at the moment it would be the mg4 for you if you think more in you want to drive something special you want something nice as for efficiency and so on the updated volvo xc40 is very decent definitely and of course you cannot deny the benchmark the tesla model 3 because it always delivers you a good price performance ratio and good fast charging network as for kia and hyundai they build very decent vehicles and of course are very good in really really quick charging so overall of these vehicles i would say the kia ev6 delivers the best package overall so at this moment when it's just about the price get the mg4 actually then if you want the best overall electric vehicle i would actually pick the kia ev6 and if you want something in between like the best price performance but at the same time a little bit more space then you're still with the Tesla Model 3. Again, maybe best if you're not as tall as me. What do you think? Tell me your comments. Which one would you go for? And see you at more comparison episodes.